Welcome to Excellence Share, everybody. I am Anne uh, from Call of the Canine. Most of you guys uh, probably know me as uh, Anne from Downtown Dogs, but after I sold Downtown Dogs, I was on a non-compete for five years. So now I am back as Anne from Call of the Canine, and I'm just so happy to be back in the dog world. I really didn't realize how much I'd missed it till I came back. Um, and I'm so excited that everyone is here because because um, nobody can become a great dog trainer on their own. You just can't, no amount of education will do it. You need mentors, you need community, you need other people that are as excited as you about behavior that will dissect videos with you and, um, and brainstorm on problems for hours and get energy from it. Um, and the reason, we, so the reason we have this amazing and vibrant training scene in the Twin Cities Metro is because of that great community. So thank you to everyone for being part of it. And um, that we're really tight on time. If this was a physical uh, some or a physical conference, we could have multiple sessions going on all at the same time, and people could pick and choose where they wanted to go. But of course, uh, this is virtual, so they kind of have to go one by one. So if a speaker does not have time to answer your questions, you could uh, contact them privately in a PM or give them a shout out on the Facebook group or put something in the comments. But uh, we all worked really hard to condense our presentations as short as they could possibly be. So um, because we're tight on time, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Bailey who is gonna introduce our first speaker, the infamous Sarah from Possibilities. Yes, Sarah Rushi gets to kick us off with the first presentation today. Sarah owns Possibilities Dog Training. They serve clients in the Southeast Minnesota and Twin Cities Metro area, as well as virtual clients across the world. She's got a list of letters, CBCC, KA, CPDT, KSA, and CBT. She's a lifelong behavior nerd. Canine aerobics combine enrichment with exploring who your dog is as an individual. Find out how you can use novel experiences with the five senses to reach a more intimate understanding of what makes your dog tick. Canine aerobics by Sarah Rushi. Sarah Rushi, canine aerobics. Um, so I think you have to make me the host so that I can screen share. Perfect. All right. So let me just pull this up for you all. All right. Can you guys see the neurobic screen? Perfect. Okay, um, I'm just setting my timer up. So timer for 15 minutes so that I can make sure that I'm not eating to anyone else's time. So we're just gonna dive right in. Um, let's start with talking about what neurobics are. Um, so neurobics are exercises that are designed to create new neural pathways by using the senses in unconventional ways. Um, so we know a lot about how brains work and a lot of that understanding has changed over the past 20 years. We used to think that you grew your brain uh, as you were you know, a child or a puppy. And then the connections you had were the connections you had and it kind of pruned from there. And that thinking has actually changed a bit. So um, now there's, there's some research that you can actually create new connections. Um, and that can prevent uh, mental decline as you age. Um, so neurobics are different from enrichment. Enrichment is anything that elicits a normal species specific behavior. So in our dogs, that would be things like scavenging, uh, digging, ripping crap apart. <laughs> um, those are all normal species specific behaviors. With uh, neurobics, we're specifically looking at using the senses in unconventional ways so you're still going to have some crossover. Um, there's definitely a lot of enrichment is also neurobics and a lot of neurobics are also enrichment, but they are two different things. Um, so K9 neurobics were originally kind of developed and they've been studied in people. The name that you want, uh, if you're getting onto Google Scholar after this and geeking out about neurobics, um, which I highly, highly recommend is Dr. Lawrence Katz, so K-A-T-Z. Um, and most of the research to date has been focused on older adults and seniors. So 
I feel like the best way to kind of give you an example of what neurobics is, is to just give you an example instead of talking about what it does. So we're going to talk about some human neurobics first. So neurobics is going to be using your senses in novel ways. Um, so think about things like perhaps you're going to brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand, or uh, you might turn all the photos and paintings in your office upside down for a day. Or maybe you're going to make a snack out of only savory umami foods, listen to a new type of music, wake up to a new scent every day. So I might put chili powder by my bed and sniff that when I wake up today. And then tomorrow I might put some vanilla um, essence by my bed and sniff that when I wake up. But you're just doing something kind of outside of the routine to really stimulate your senses. So what do you need to know about neurobics? Um, there's several things as you're kind of diving into playing around with this with uh, your dog or with any other animals in your household. I do this with my guinea pigs, um, even my fish. I've got a couple clicker trained fish because of who I am as a person. <laughs> um, so first thing to kind of think about is stress. Stress is necessary for learning. If we don't stress our brains, uh, it doesn't create um, protein synthesis and we don't learn anything. So stress isn't necessarily bad, right? There's eustress, which is good stress, winning the lottery, and there's distress, which is bad stress, getting your home foreclosed on. Stress is not necessarily bad, but neurobics exercises are in and of themselves stressful. They should be eustress, they should be good stress for our dogs, but any change from the ordinary is going to be stressful. So you really need to look at your learner and make sure that your dog um, isn't overly stressed and that they're having a good time. We want them to be able to kind of opt in to this. So I like to use the Goldilocks principle. We don't want too little, we don't want too much. We want just the right amount of stress, right? Enough that our animal is learning, but not so much that we're overwhelming them or causing distress. Really do think about how your dog perceives the world. And I'm using perceives instead of how they see the world because dogs are not primarily visual and we are. So if you're, for example, doing some neurobics based on vision and those neurobics um, have to do with the colors like uh, red and green, well, dogs are red, green, colorblind. That's not gonna do your animal any good, right? So you have to really think about how your dog's perception of the world is going to drive how they perceive the neurobics. And if you don't know, observe. They will absolutely show you how they're perceiving things in their behavior and their responses. So when you're designing neurobics exercises or introducing neurobics exercises, um, use the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, <laughs> or keep it simple, silly. Um, these should be short little exercises, you know, one to five minutes, just fun little experiments in your dog's senses. How do they react to new things? How do they react to something being just outside of the norm? Um, here's kind of one of my favorite quotes as we watch our dog's reactions and use that to, um, to design future neurobics exercises. So things that I'm thinking about with my learner, um, how does my dog feel about novelty in general? So I wanna know, um, do I have a dog that's an enrichment seeker or do I have a dog that finds enrichment and novelty really aversive? Um, I currently have um, two dogs in my household that were raised with um, puppy culture, with a socialization program, they really think any novelty is fun stuff and they're all in. But that may not be the case for every dog. A lot of the fosters that I take in find anything new just absolutely overwhelming. So if you've got one of those dogs that isn't into novelty, you wanna make sure that you're honoring that and letting them opt out. Um, Think about your animal and what senses are the most sensitive. If they're hypersensitive in one or more senses, you're probably not going to start doing aerobics with those senses, right? Uh, my heart dog, Layla, who's actually the dog that our um, logo is based on, was really touch sensitive. 
And so with her adding tactile neurobics early on, probably not a good idea. There's also hyposensitivity. So if I have a dog that I know is um, maybe a touch junky, and they're one of those dogs that doesn't even seem to realize when they get hurt, um, and they're just, you know, all in all the time, regardless of physical sensations, then I can probably introduce a little bit more neurobics for tactile for that animal. Um, and then I'm going to look at how does my animal react to this particular exercise? You know, do I want to adjust it so that I'm hitting that Goldilocks principle of just right? And always, always, um, my dog's free to opt in or out, right? If they want to leave, that's totally cool. Um, I'm not going to track them <laughs> in an aerobics exercise. I want them to be like, okay, what's this? This is really not. So, Let's give you guys some ideas for designing neurobics exercises. Um, so first of all, just kind of in general, the easiest way to look at this is to look at um, normal things you do every day and then just tweaking them. You know, a human example would be, I might gather my clothes up to get dressed and then uh, sit down on the edge of my bed and close my eyes and get dressed with my eyes closed. So I'm taking away vision and instead I'm using my tactile senses to get dressed um, by feeling the different clothing and putting it on that manner, right? So I'm taking my normal routine and then I'm just flipping it a little bit. So think about um, different times. Maybe I usually walk my dog in the afternoon, but I know that dogs see best and are most active at dawn and dusk. So perhaps as an aerobics exercise, I'm going to walk my dog at dusk instead. I won't be able to see as well, but she'll sure be able to see much better, much more clearly. Uh, I might try different locations. So maybe instead of snuggling on uh, the couch or my bed, we're gonna go snuggle in the guest bedroom um, and just be in that different place. Or maybe I'm going to move my dog's food bowl or their water bowl or their bed. You can see how for some dogs, this is going to be really interesting, right? They're going to be really interested in how you're tweaking things. But for other dogs, this could be stressful. So I want to make sure that my learner's all in and I'm ready to switch things back if they're like, this isn't cool. Um, I might present things in a different order. So usually, you know, if I have my kind of routine when I'm getting ready to take my dog on a walk, where first I put on my shoes and then I grab my treat bag uh, and then I put on anything else I need, headlamp or my coat or gloves or hat because we're in Minnesota for some reason. Um, and then I put my dog on leash and we go out the door. Maybe I'm just gonna flip that order a little bit. Put the, my dog on leash first, put my shoes on last. Um, so just flip the order slightly. And then different presentations. So what I might do is take my dog's dinner and let's say I feed raw. I might provide half of dinner as I usually do thawed out and the other half maybe I'm going to provide frozen um, or I'm going to pour warm water over the other half. If I feed kibble, maybe I'm going to feed half of it as usual and the other half um, in a snuffle mat or feed the other half um, with warm water over it, or maybe warm water and a little bit of gelatin to make kind of a, a kibble jello for my dog. Um, different textures can be really interesting. So as we look at the senses, uh, olfactory is where I like to start in aerobics for most dogs. It can be something as simple as um, when I've gone to continuing education, if I'm going to like a zoo and I'm getting to interact with zoo animals in any um, format, I'm not just touching them with my hands. I'm gonna make sure I get some on my sleeve and then bring that nice stinky shirt that's touched a baby elephant home from the conference so that my dogs can check it out. Uh, or you can take a Ziploc baggie along with you when you're walking one dog, just grab a little bit of the you know soil or snow or leaves or whatever that your dog's really interested in and present it to the other dogs in your household or cats or guinea pigs or whatever you've got. And just be like, here's Tuesday's walk. Um, this is what was interesting on today's walk. Here's a selection of scents for you to enjoy. Uh, visual, 
This could be something like moving your furniture, going on those dusk or dawn walks, teaching a new visual cue. So maybe I'm going to teach that that, tapping my head twice, is the cue for sit, right? So new cue, fit, and reward. Um, so that I'm introducing that new visual cue. There we go, gustatory, <laughs> so different tastes. Um, I might introduce taste flight. So here's some squeezy cheese, here's some shredded Parmesan, here's some grated Parmesan, here's some fresh mozzarella, and here's some sharp cheddar. Um, so try these different cheese tastes, and then let's see which one you like best. Auditory, maybe I'm going to turn on some background noises for my dog, again, quiet, where they can choose to leave. Uh, if they want to, I recommend going to YouTube and just typing in white noise. Um, and you can play city sounds or cafe sounds or thunderstorms or waves or nature sounds. There's all sorts of options. Uh, my dogs really think whale sounds are interesting. They really hate like wolf or coyote sounds. They're like, this is very stupid. Um, but they think it's really interesting playing barnyard sounds. And then tactile, maybe I'm going to massage or pet my dog in different ways. Maybe I'll go from tail to head instead of head to tail and see what they think. And do they like it if I have a flat hand or just wiggly fingertips, things like that. Um, digging is a great one. So set up an under the bed storage bin and fill it up with um, sand if you don't mind a lot of vacuuming and finding sand in your bed <laughs> later that night. <laughs> Um, but it could also be something like strips of fleece, stuffed toys, washcloths and towels, and let your dog dig in that bin. So there's lots of different ways that you can present an aerobics. Um, I actually gave like a two day seminar on canine aerobics and um, 10 week long classes. I've also done six week long classes. So there's a lot to dive into here, but hopefully I've given you some ideas for how you can introduce aerobics to your dog. So if you have questions, um, I have 40 seconds left. <laughs> um, what I recommend is contact me at what, any one of these. Uh, you can get to me. Email's probably best. I'm backed up on an email right now, but shoot me an email and I, I will respond. <laughs> um, it just might take me just a little while, but Shoot me questions if you've got them. Thank you guys so much for listening and I'm so excited to see all of your presentations coming up. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and take the screen down and I'm going to turn over host privileges to Bailey again. Oh, that's my timer for 15 minutes. Look at that. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Sarah. All right, I'm going to introduce Elise Denim Probasco. Elise, oh, my cat is touching my computer. Okay. <laughs> Elise has a passion for animal behavior and training, and it's rooted in a love of working with and helping people. After a first career in youth development and community organizing, Elise return to a childhood dream of working with animals. Functioning as a relationship coach between humans and their pets, Elise brings a trauma-informed and harm reduction approach to the work. Elise focuses on enhancing the human-animal bond through education about communication and learning styles and through behavior modification for everyone in the home, including the humans. She's certified by the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers and currently contracting with Possibilities Dog Training. Elise says, as consultants, we often come up with training plans that will get a dog from A to Z in the most efficient way, but technical skills or complex plans are not compatible with all homes. How do we approach both the humans and the animals with empathy and prioritize their stress reduction? A harm reduction, trauma-informed approach to consulting by Elise Denim Probasco. Elise Denim Probasco, a harm reduction, trauma-informed approach to consulting. And I will give you permissions here if I can find your name. Here we go. 
There you go. Hello. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I am, I guess, um, I'm not a baby trainer, I guess, anymore. I've been doing this for several years now, but um, come from a lot of coaching backgrounds, so bringing a lot of my people background in. Um, I started with the Humane Society. I was being apprenticed with Blasca Perro doing Humane Society outreach, which was private in-home sessions in a specific neighborhood for 30 minutes for free for folks. Um, so I, unlike most trainers, I entered this through behavior modification and then learned skill training. Um, and entered it kind of from a management approach first before a uh, full behavior modification plan. So I feel like that's a little different than other people, which kind of informs what I do. So I'm going to pull up the presentation. Wait a minute. Boy, that's the end. Don't look cheat. Okay. So we're just going to jump in, talk about what is harm reduction. Harm reduction is all about reducing the effects of a behavior versus stopping the behavior. Um, when I worked in with youth development with teenagers, a uh, majority of them were poor, housing, food, employment, insecure with their families, um, experiencing a lot of racial, class, gender, sexuality, disability issues, and what's the word I'm looking for, discrimination, some generational systemic problems, chronic stress. Um, so harm reduction comes from drug use approaches, interventions, but has really been applicable across the board. So with teenagers, uh, that was really about, okay, these teens are probably going to be drinking, smoking, et cetera, doing these other behaviors that I, as their mentor, maybe didn't want them to do, but how can I help them do it in a way that mitigates the negative effects of those perhaps risky behaviors? This is also, side note, a great response for how to deal with COVID is through harm reduction. Um, in my experience with the outreach program, as well as with teenagers, I did learn that money can make things easier, but it doesn't solve all problems. You still can have chronic stress for a variety of reasons. Some examples of harm reduction in the drug use community are safe injection sites. So places where people can needle exchange, um, inject or use their drugs under supervision so that it reduces the risk of overdose if there's trained people there supervising and um, any infections or cross contamination, et cetera. A really important part of this is not taking away the person's coping skill and not shaming them for that behavior. I like to think of this a little bit as Lima is for people, least invasive, minimally aversive. Um, it also has broader implications. I took care of a friend a week ago, uh, did some quarantine for COVID so that I could be with this friend who lives alone post-op and they were terrible at following their post-operative recovery um, for various reasons. So I'd have a harm reduction approach and my help with them. It was how can, if they're going to do this thing they're not supposed to, how can I help them do it in the least harmful way. Then what is trauma-informed? Trauma-informed is kind of taking place in medical communities right now, but it's also a part of psychotherapy and um, psychiatry, psychology, counseling approach as well. So it is recognizing that a lot of what we do will impact someone who's experiencing trauma, that there are different symptoms of trauma than uh, what everyone was recognizing maybe five, 10 years ago, and that there's a lot of unseen stress and unseen trauma. An example in the medical community would be if you were attending a gynecologist visit and the gynecologist is trauma informed, they would be saying, may I touch you here before they touch you every time, or they would say, I am going to do this. Is that okay with you? Um, or they would say, remind you that I can stop at any time, this isn't crucial, et cetera. In psychotherapy, it is about, in my experience, it is about um, recognizing that the, if someone is experiencing a chronic stress or if they have a past trauma, whether that is a single event trauma that happened to them as an individual or whether that is a complex or chronic um, kind of micro level traumas that, that continues, whether it happened to them as an individual or to their culture or generational, et cetera, recognizing that that could impact their ability to learn, also their ability for behavior change. 
Uh, as we know from animals, can't teach if the animal is afraid, if they're in fight or flight. So same with people. We are really good as people at masking that and functioning as normal. So being trauma informed is kind of looking for some of those subtle symptoms and tells as well as just approaching people assuming that they are in stress. Um, at the end, I have a few resources that give you some of the main principles for harm reduction work or also trauma-informed works. So you can look into those more. One of the things that for me coming from that background um, as a client of those approaches, as well as a practitioner of those approaches with teenagers and then working with the outreach program, I have found some troubles with some more traditional ABA behavior modification training plans, not that they aren't great, um, but they so often assume that the client has resources. I really love um, possibilities on our behavior questionnaire. We ask what are the resources that are available to the client? That's a great question. And I found such a varying response, but also that some clients don't even know how to answer that question. They might put a financial cap on it, or they might say, I'll do anything, um, but there really are actual resources. So I like to ask my clients about not just money and time, but what's your emotional resources? What is your energy resources? How adaptable is your lifestyle? Well, how much consistency do you have? Because I feel like our traditional training plans assume, if we don't assume money, we often assume consistency and predictability. Um, it's hard to make a training plan without consistency and predictability, even focusing strictly on management to prevent the problem, not even to make the problem better or stop it. Um, takes consistency and predictability. We also, in typical dog training, we send to center a typical lifestyle of white, middle, upper class, cis heteronormative, married family with kids, um, versus considering a lot of what I worked with in poor and struggling communities and families would be multi-generational homes where there's 12 people who come in and out, maybe six of them live there permanently and the other six uh, sometimes live there, sometimes don't. Uh, homes where there are cons, it's just a revolving door. People live there for six months and they stop living there or someone is there all the time even though they don't live there. Um, where it might be one parent with a bunch of kids and also is trying to parent kids down the street or there might be four adults who are co-parenting in the home. Um, sometimes part-time, sometimes full-time. So there's a lot of additional factors that are in place. Uh, likewise, living in a community that is low income means that there's gonna be some less resources and additional stress. Um, if they are not white, they're gonna be experiencing generational racism and current racism. You know, if they're in a community of over-policing, there's gonna be additional problems with that and additional um, critique on their animal. If they have a barking dog, they're going to get extra calls on their dog, etc. The other limitation is that positive reinforcement training is hard. Um, if we are doing strictly clicker training, there is a lot of precision that's required. And someone who is experiencing chronic stress in their life is going to be have a hard time doing that much focusing. I think a lot of traditional training plans expect clients to kind of become mini trainers which can be really difficult. And not a lot of clients want to become a mini trainer. It also takes time and not everybody has time. It's one of the reasons I'm really drawn toward ethology with Kim Brophy because she's really practical in uh, her responses as not expecting people to be trainers. I really rely heavily on coaching for people to become fluent in behavior um, body language of pets. And I am also recognizing that that some, for some people is too hard. Um, again, if you're chronically stressed, it's hard to focus on just that. A lot of examples I'm giving are about um, communal, generational, economic, uh, and racial disparities and stress, but it also middle and upper class white people can also be experiencing chronic stress within the home. I have a current client who sounds like a clear cut case, gave them my tips, and they came back three weeks later and haven't done any of them. And they it was just clear to me that the client is experiencing some degree of exhaustion and fatigue. I don't know what it's related to. It's I don't think it's about the dog. Um, so we kind of have to pause. We are not going to get any help for this dog if I keep expecting the owner to be able to do this easy plan, um, what I thought was easy and clear cut. So I have to re-figure that out. 
Um, here's some of the questions I like to ask my clients, um, even if it is not a severe case, in my opinion, a severe case, I like to dive into these in my intake session. Um, quality of life indicators, I like to find out for every individual in the home, which again can be hard if there's a lot of uh, transients of who is considered an individual in the home, but what are their needs in life, um, especially related to the animal. And then I also look at the animal's needs. So for example, I need an animal who can be left alone. I briefly had an animal that couldn't and I realized very quickly that's not something I can live with. Um, what do I want is I want an animal that doesn't beg for food and I want an animal that isn't really vocal, uh, but I can, those are compromisable. Um, I want a dog that will hang out with my friends when they come over and have a great time, but I will accept a dog that is kenneled behind a closed door when my friends come over, but I need a dog that can be kenneled behind a closed door. Um, that's not a compromise I can make in my life. So when I ask my clients that I often, it's interesting what they come up with. It can surprise me and really impact uh, my recommendations moving forward. Likewise, hard limits is part of that. Um, so my hard limit is a, my dogs must be able to be kenneled and alone. Um, for some clients, it might be that they can only pay $20 a month on their dog. Um, that can be a hard limit, just financially, they can't do more than that. Uh, for others, it would be that they will keep this dog. They're not going to rehome, they're not going to euthanize no matter how severe their hard limit is they're keeping this dog. So how can we make that least harmful, especially if there's aggression involved or severe anxiety? And then I also ask my clients, what is a reasonable change in their mind? So when I come up with management or suggestions, I say, is that reasonable in your home? This client that I referenced that I thought was going to be really clear cut and easy, I thought gating off the kitchen would stop the counter surfing really easily. They said that gating the kitchen was not reasonable, cannot do it. Um, harm reduction as approach is for me to not judge, why can't you just gate off your kitchen? That'd be super easy, come on. You're causing yourself a bunch of extra stress, but instead to say, okay, that's not reasonable. Now I need to be more creative and come up with an alternative. That's a hard one because gating is really nice. Um, also, what would take the edge off? For me, this is really about looking at the trauma-informed approach for, I want to restore that human-animal bond. I want to decrease the human stress at least one notch. I may not be able to address the other problems in their life, but what can we give them some breathing room? Can we give them a, just a tinge more ability to cope? Um, because trauma is all about being over, your coping skills are overwhelmed. Um, so if they could change one thing, usually there's a tons of stress related to the animal, multiple things, you know, they eat off the counter, they jump on guests, they dig in the yard. If you could only pick one thing, what would it be? Um, and the other questions I ask is, what would it take for you to enjoy your dog more? And sometimes that's a different answer than the, what one thing would you change, which then we have to have a conversation. If we can help them enjoy their dog more and restore that bond, that in Michael Shikashio's words, is a deposit into the emotional bank account, which then helps them cope and might help them deal with these other things. So here's some examples. Uh, the first, Osa Callisto is my dog. Uh, who could not be left alone. I was in a trauma moment of chronic stress and she had a lot of problems and I had trainer friends who gave me great training plans, great management plans, and I couldn't do them. I just couldn't do them. She kept peeing on the carpet. She kept having panic attacks. She kept aggressing to my housemate. So I, I actually euthanized her and that's a different story, but I would have rehomed her if that had been an option um, because I couldn't do those plans and they were simple but they didn't work in my life. Skylar J is my friend's cat who uh, had a collapsed wrist and had to have PT and a brace on, but that significantly harmed her psychological health. And so we decided that her walking on a bad wrist that would have future problems was better than her psychological um, harm from it because cooperative care was not an option for this cat. And there's a longer story why. Next one, no touchy, is my favorite. 
It is from Carrie Davis and Family Dog Mediation at Possibilities. There was a dog and child, the child could not stop themselves from touching the dog. And the dog was head shy, just not liking it. Um, so they took the dog to the groomer and dyed the dog's hair where the child was not supposed to touch. And that was a great visual cue for the child and resolved the bad touch experience. Um, I'm gonna skip over Poppy first time, but that he's the poster child from the outreach program at the Humane Society uh, for spay and neuter, but turns out the dog had a lot of issues. We just focused on the kids bond uh, with the dog because the family had no capacity for dealing with it. Hyper Golden, this was an outreach client whose dog was destroying everything and driving the elderly owners bonkers. In outreach, we were able to give free supplies. We gave them, I believe, four Kongs and maybe a Kong wobbler and another toy and just said, round the clock, stuff these, feed your dog with these. And they called a few weeks later and said they had an entirely different dog. They loved their dog. Life was so much better. And all it took was Kongs. So there you have it. Um, if you have questions, you can email me. There are links at the end about harm reduction and trauma-informed work. They're all about people, but you can, you're smart people. You can uh, translate it over to dog work. I don't know how to give you back the hosting capabilities. Thank you, Elise. That was amazing. I was frantically taking notes the whole time. And if I knew how to do that clapping thing like Michelle is, I would do it. Um, Elise, if you hover over Stevie's name and it, there should be a little um, arrow and Got it. Press that you can make great the host because she's next. Stevie Mathry has a long list of accomplishments accomplishments under her belt. She's been training dogs since 1997 and earned her, her CPDT in 2006. And she got her skills assessed in 2009. In 2009, she started All Smart Pets and has been working virtually with clients through possibilities training since 2018. Stevie has been focusing on behavior consulting cases for the past 12 years. She's the training director for the Red River North Dog Obedience Club in Fargo. She competes in obedience, rally, agility with her colleagues, colleagues, probably with colleagues too. <laughs> She's active in trick dog training, backpacking, tracking, and nose work. She's also trained therapy and service dogs. Stevie's going to talk to us today about an all too important topic, the difference between training and behavior consulting. Sometimes training a new behavior, setting up management, or sharpening an owner's skill set just isn't going to solve the problem. Stevie's going to talk about the differences and when each is appropriate. Is it just bad manners by Stevie Mathry? Stevie Mathry, is it just bad manners? Um, let's see. Uh, I do not have fancy PowerPoint presentation like everyone else has had so far. Um, what I do have is a Word document. So I hope I can just share that with you. It's not, um, oh, uh, let's see here. <laughs> I am... If, do you have the document up on your screen? I do. Okay, so I think if you go to the bottom and hover over, there should be a green button that says screen share. Yeah. Try that. What I'm looking at. It says cancel or open screen preferences. So I'm not sure. Oh, and that just gets me into something different. Um, I'm certainly able to do this uh, without this, this is just some notes. Um, but I, I thought I'd share it just so that you could follow along. And I don't see it where. If it's a Google Doc, you could put the link in the comments, then we could launch it on our own devices. Um, it's actually not, it's just on Word. Because of course, I was doing this late last night. <laughs> just talk to us, we just wanna yeah. hear you. Okay. That'd be amazing. Okay, well, let's see, I've got the portion of screen. 
maybe that, no, that doesn't work either. I'm, I'm sorry, I will um, get back to just, just me, I guess. Okay. Um, I'm gonna pull it up a little bit on my screen so I can just follow along and keep track of where I am. So um, anyway, uh, there, there's many ways that we can work within dog training uh, as, as an umbrella term. Um, what I wanna talk about is training versus behavior consulting. Um, like Bailey introduced, thank you. Um, uh, in knowing that there's going to be a lot of overlap, there's going to be times when one is appropriate versus the other. Um, it sometimes is hard to differentiate when we're in which realm and when we need to hand the baton to someone in a different sphere of training. So uh, to start with, I just want to go over some of the very general characteristics of each and how they overlap and how we can work with them. Um, when I'm thinking of training, I am thinking of installing behaviors that a dog doesn't already know or has a limited understanding of, perhaps it's not fully fluent or on cue for a handler. Um, and the behaviors are, are generally meant to be offered by the dog in response to a cue from a handler instead of, um, uh, instead of in response to the environment, although that does happen because there are certain behaviors in the training realm such as uh, house training in which I expect my dog to initiate the request to go outside. I wouldn't consider that necessarily a behavior consulting issue unless it's causing other problems in the, in the home. Um, generally in training, we're working in operant conditioning and there's oftentimes not a real strong emotional connection to the behavior um, with the exception of maybe greyhounds don't like to sit, um, but that's kind of the extent of the really big feelings uh, towards behaviors. There's certainly problem solving that happens within training. Uh, for example, simply teaching your dog to come when called as, as a problem solving behavior or teaching a incompatible behavior in, um, in, for example, something that's incompatible with jumping on guests. Um, that's, that's part of problem solving too. And still would, I would consider come under the training aspect. Um, environment and antecedents are generally addressed as ways to generalize the behavior. We teach a behavior and then we add the distractions and those distractions are actually part of the environment and act as antecedents towards the behavior. Um, whereas in behavior consulting, we're obviously we're changing an existing behavior, a behavior that's already been identified as causing a problem in, their, in the dog's family in their life. Um, we're changing the emotions of both the dog and the owner. So instead of simply a preference to sit or lie down, we're talking about extreme emotions in the presence of a trigger. And we need to change some of those emotions. We oftentimes are working in the realm of classical conditioning rather than operant conditioning to do that. Um, problem solving is endemic to behavior consulting and not so much in training. Although there are people who say, the problem is my dog hasn't earned a utility dog title yet. That's the owner's choice to decide that that's a problem. Um, problem solving in behavior modification is a little bit, um, uh, it's the reason that they can contact us rather than I'd like my dog to earn a title. And when we're doing this, in training, of course, I said the antecedents and the situation come at the back end of the behavior. In behavior consulting, we're looking at those things early on when we're doing our intake. What's the situation? What's the other dog doing to cause the emotional output that, that your dog is experiencing? Um, 
And our goal is often not to emit those behaviors in response to an owner's cue, but rather the, the dog offers the new behavior in response to an environment or a situation. So just generally that's that's uh, kind of an overview of those of kind of the realms that they take. Um, it, it, they're not linear in the sense that a trainer doesn't prom get promoted to behavior consultants. Um, they are separate and parallel tracks. There's lots of different areas of, of training which don't equate to the same kind of problem solving that behavior consulting does. And behavior consulting doesn't necessarily install the same set of skills that a trainer would. So um, both are necessary to work together. Um, there are times in which a behavior consultant may need simply a trainer to take over one aspect of the behavior modification plan. Um, there's a lot of overlap in skill set. Uh, I think that behavior consultants still need to have really good training chops in teaching the owners how to address a problem, how to implement the classical conditioning that we're setting up for them. Um, trainers also need to have skill set and knowledge and experience in knowing what there's their, their, their um, uh, what their skills are and their interests and in um, knowing when to refer to either a behavior consultant or veterinary behaviorist, veterinary medical professional in order to find the, the reason of for the behavior that the dog is experiencing. Um, a lot of times owners will self-identify the problems that their dogs have and sometimes misidentify. So a client that says, hey, I really need behavior consulting because my dog is aggressive. And during an during a intake, you find that really the dog just didn't know how to heal, didn't know how to not pull on leash. Um, and sometimes an owner will misidentify in the other direction. Hey, my dog's, he's just bad mannered. And this is where I get it a lot is, no, don't we just need to train him to um, be polite when people answer the door. And when we get into the intake and that initial consult, we find that, well, there may be some other situations in which the dog is behaving inappropriately. It's not just barking and jumping on guests. It's hiding under the bed. It's peeing inappropriately in the house. There's a whole um, panoply of behaviors that, that all inform the reason that the owner contacted us. Um, and in that case, it's not just a training issue, but we need to actually be working on the anxiety that underlies all of everything. Um, um, there, there is this overlap and this confusion, I think, between the two because we don't have the professional standards or oversight in dog training. And there's no clear cut demarcation sometimes between. Um, the easiest, I think, is just to look at the classical versus operant conditioning. If we're working classical conditioning, we're probably in the behavior consulting side. If we're working operant conditioning, conditioning, oftentimes it is training, but maybe um, classical conditioning or behavior consulting would be more appropriate at that point. It depends on the issue that's that the owners are experiencing. Um, there's, I think, especially in beginning dog training, people who are just getting started and exploring the field, not quite understanding where to put their energies and their resources in learning. Um, there's breadth in both areas. And with more information about that and more opportunity to learn, we'll be able to kind of drill down into what your specialty wants, what you want your specialty to be. Um, you don't have to do everything for all dogs and having that referral network um, is important. Um, 
it is sometimes difficult when you're starting out not to take cases because you need to grow a client list. You need to make enough money to justify staying in your new, new career. Um, uh, it, so sometimes trainers will take on cases that are beyond what their skill set is. Sometimes behavior consultants will take on cases which could have more easily been dealt with in a training realm. And I think that's fairly common too. It speaks to, to addressing the, the needs and the wants that the clients have and how to manage their expectations. Uh, like Elise was saying, you know, clients have certain expectations of a behavior which may or may not be good for them according to the plan that, that, that you've set up. We need to manage those expectations, but also manage our own expectations. Whereas my expectation of good behavior at the door is going to be different than a client's. And how do I push them? Am I pushing them inappropriately to my expectation of behavior rather than what works for their home? Um, all of this kind of ties into the idea of the law of the instrument, which is a cognitive bias idea, which basically it's, if you have a hammer, every problem that you encounter is going to look like a nail and it, it goes both ways in training. We can take a dog that's misbehaving and saying, Hey, just teach him to sit, um, sit to say, please. It, it really common phrase that I hear all the time. And that may solve the problem of jumping on the counter, but does it? It changes a behavior for a short term. Sometimes it, it's good enough for the owner and that's gonna be appropriate in that case. Um, on the other side of the equation, I think that behavior consultants can sometimes have a tool that they use to exclusion of others. For example, a really common one is protocol for relaxation. Um, I find it very useful. I use it a lot, but it's not appropriate for every case. And if that's the tool that's in my tool chest, um, it may not be appropriate for the dog that say just needs to learn to walk on a loose leash or um, the the, the protocol, I had an example, and of course, I didn't write it down, I, um, so it's gone now. Um, we have to look at each individual case, pick the skills that are necessary for them. In And so it, it's in the skills, it's in our expectations, and it's in the choice of approach that we take. All have to do with the, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail type um, approach to things. So being aware of that, uh, if we can mentor, get, get new trainers involved in the continuing education. Eventually, I hope there will be oversight and um, better certifications available for dog training that, that increases our visibility as a profession and um, will help people find the right area to search for the answers that they need. So um, I, I do apologize for not being able to share my screen. I'm not exact, I have not shared screens before. So that was a new one to me, but if, are there other comments, questions that, that we've got time for? I'm, I just want to say thank you for bringing that up. I think, especially in our region, we have a lot of like board and train type trainers and they, they'll take on stuff that like the, the clients, like my dog is aggressive and like the board and trains, like I can solve that. And like their dog comes home and knows how to sit and lay down and stay. <laughs> and you know, this, we're not, Bailey and I aren't in the cities. We're Fargo Moorhead area. So there's a, big lag in expertise. There's a big lag in opportunity. Um, I know when I moved to this area, I'm, I'm from this area, was away for grad school for several years. When I moved back, I, I was hoping to get a daycare started. No one in Fargo-Moorhead had even heard of a daycare. This was in 98. Um, and and it, 
in fact, I was turned down by the Small Business Administration. I could not get mentorship for any kind of business regarding that at all. Now we've got those daycares, but we still lag behind in a lot of other areas and just understanding where people need their expertise and how to find it. So yay virtual training, right? Yay, well, I'm sure glad you guys are there as leaders um, for at the bleeding edge of the change in that uh, area. And thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. I loved it. Thank you. Yeah, thank and you. Steve, if you could um, hand over the host to Kate. Okay, and that's her name. name. A little arrow should appear. Um, make host, there it is. Thank you. So Kate, Kate has been working as a trainer and behavior consultant since 2005. Oh, it's all good. Something happened. Oh, you can't see me. Do I need oh, to stop? Oh, so I can introduce myself too. Okay. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm Kate. I think all, almost all of you know me. Uh, so hi, it's me. Uh, I have been a dog professional for a long time. I'm a certified trainer, both knowledge and skills assessed, a certified behavior co consultant, both through the CCPDT and the IABC, a certified family pause parent educator. I do some research on the side for kicks. Um, yeah. And I am going to talk to you guys today about the absolutely most exciting possible topic. Um, actually, it's very near and dear to me. They are boring slides, I warn you uh, in advance, but I've kept them really boring because I thought they might be useful things to go back to later as notes. So here's where I'm gonna start. Uh, and if, if you're not muted, if you could mute yourself, that'd be awesome. Um, our industry, you guys are, I'm sure all aware is currently unregulated. By the way, I, I absolutely paid, um, Stevie to set me up super well here. Uh, so we've got this unregulated industry. Anybody can call themselves anything. They can use any of those labels. Um, since certification or credentialing is voluntary, why should you do it? It you know, costs money, takes time and effort. Um, I think first and foremost, it should show others that you're educated, knowledgeable, competent, and skilled, right? It's gonna demonstrate that you've had to jump through some sort of hoop. Overall, and I think more importantly, it legitimizes the work that we do. It demonstrates that the work that we do is important. It highlights the education required to be a safe and effective practitioner. Okay, so it's also about what it's communicating to the rest of the world. And I think it oper uh, creates this great opportunity from a marketing perspective, just as a business owner, I'd say you can differentiate yourself. You could highlight the specialties that you have. It also, I think, allows you to connect and be valued by other professionals. So vets, uh, medical professionals, lawyers, uh, all these other folks who have understand the idea of credentialing and the need for education and what they do. And I think we can better relate to those individuals when we can come and say, hey, look, I've also jumped through these hoops. I also have credentials or licensing maybe in my industry. Um, so the First thing I want to talk briefly about is this idea of occupational licensure. I got a lot of jargon here. This stuff was new to me fairly recently, um, but I think it's really important to understand. And occupational licensure essentially is, the, well, first there's several groups who've started pushing for regulation of the dog industry, just like Stevie was talking about, like maybe there's this move in that direction. And it's awesome to see there's been some legislation that's been introduced or is in the process of being introduced in some various states. So you have an understanding of what this means. Licensure is um, it usually varies state by state, although we can make federal, lic uh, federal licensure rules if we wanted. Um, licensure is something that's created through legislation or an act of law. And it's typically governed by a licensing board. So basically, first, there's this whole legislation piece that has to go through uh, the government and be passed. And then um, usually there's a board that is created that oversees the actual act of licensing individuals. The primary purpose of a licensure board or occupational licensure as a whole is going to be to protect 
the public. Okay. Um, as a side effect, it might serve to support people in the industry, like the acting professionals or people in the process of becoming a licensed professional. But the primary purpose is always going to be about public protection. And in general, um, what's going to happen is a board would be set up and they create a set of standards that identify minimum competency. Okay, or the minimum qualifications that somebody has to have to practice. So the idea is, you know, we've figured out that there's stuff that you have to know to be able to do this work effectively. Um, what are the minimums that you have to know or the minimum that you have to be able to do uh, in order to be safe and effective as a professional. And just some examples of other industries that are regulated by licensing, nursing, social work, therapy, counseling, architecture, financial services, insurance, real estate, transportation, construction, healthcare. Those are all examples of professionals and professional industries that are licensed. And in general, I think when you hear the term professional, I want you to have in your head that usually professional industries or professions are licensed. Certifications, there's a ton of them. I you don't have to read any of this slide. This is just a list of certifications, credentials and titles that are in the dog industry. This list is not at all comprehensive. Uh, this is just as many as I could shove on. Some of these are gonna be based on uh, taking exams. Some are gonna be based on case study submissions. Some are gonna be about evaluating live or recorded skills of you as a professional. Some are more knowledge focused and others are going to be skills focused. Some simply require that you pay for them, right? Uh, sort of like if you want to be a black belt in karate, you can do a whole lot of work and do skills tests to verify each new level uh, until you earn your way up to a black belt. Or you can go to a karate school where you just pay $300 and they give you the black belt. Okay, um, so the credential, having some letters after your name doesn't necessarily um, in and of itself tell you anything about what you had to do to get that credential. So with all these different choices out there, you know, how do you tell what credential you should actually be focused on or working towards? Or if there is a licensure board that's formed, how are we going to decide um, what should be required? Uh, to be able to be licensed. One of the methods that we want to focus on and consider is this concept of accreditation. So accreditation is, um, is a great way to sort of sort out different credentials. Accreditation is the process by which a credentialing program is evaluated against defined standards, defined third party standards set by a credentialing community. Okay, so basically it's, um, it's rules about how to test or certify that make cr the, the, the credentialing process that or that individual credential more credible and legitimate at gauging minimum competency. So it's, it's a way to test or a set of rules that an exam process or credentialing process is held up against. Okay, um, the NCCA is sort of the one of the big fish in the credentialing world. They're sort of considered a gold standard of accreditation. And they, they set the standards for CCPDT, um, but they also set uh, standards for the certifications that are received by a, a handful of other really important occupations like nursing and respiratory theory, uh, respiratory therapists, counselors, emergency technicians, cr crane operators. So the NCCA it doesn't actually evaluate a crane operator or a dog trainer or an emergency technician. The NCCA evaluates the, the organizations that test and certify those professionals. Okay, so it's a test for the, the test, uh, the, the folks who host the tests or administer the tests. Um, let me give you some examples of what kinds of rules I'm talking about. So, so all of the rules that the NCCA set out um, are going to be about making sure that exams are rigorous and that they are getting at identifying that minimum competency threshold in whatever the industry is. So 
one set of examples are um, there are going to be rules about who can volunteer for the organization or who could be a board member for an organization. Um, those kinds of rules might limit uh, how many terms you can serve or how many committees you can be part of in a particular organization so that no individual person can have too much influence on a particular exam. It, they might also have rules about making sure that there's avoidance of conflict of interest. Um, there are rules about making sure that there's demographic diversity represented within the organizations, okay? Um, separation of education and testing is another example of a rule that the NCCA holds. And the idea is um, you can't offer educational services as an organization and also you can't offer education that's tied to the exam and then also offer the exam. So just to be really clear, this is why KPA, Karen Pryor Academy, cannot be NCCA certified um, as they currently function because they're an organization where people pay to learn and they are evaluated during that learning process and they come out uh, with uh, a title or a certificate. Um, but because KPA itself both teaches, they take the payment and they teach people the material and then they also administer the exam, there's always going to be a conflict of interest about their ability to um, gauge uh, independently the work that's there. Because of that conflict, they can't receive that accreditation. It, it doesn't necessarily invalidate KPA in any way, um, but accreditation is about having this independent standard and making sure that there aren't conflict of interests. And then the last piece I wanna talk about around accreditation is this role delineation survey, because this comes up in the JAG profession uh, and I think can be confusing to folks, but is super important. So a role delineation survey within the, the dog industry, it's required for us to maintain NCCA accreditation uh, for the CCPDT exams. And so every five years, there's a survey that goes out to practicing dog professionals. And the survey is all about identifying, getting the professionals who are actually practicing to help clarify what the critical information is in the work that they do on a regular basis. What we ask all of, the practicing professionals like, hey, what do you actually do? What do you need to do your job? And we use that collective knowledge to define, well, what should the exam look like? How many test questions should we have on this topic and that topic? What are the key topics that should be on an exam? What do people need to know in order to be minimally competent to do the work? Okay. So, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the CCPDT specifically, uh, and it's because I'm more familiar with them um, than other, I have some other certifications, but I'm most familiar with them. I currently serve on the board of directors for the CCPDT, and I'm in my second year serving as the exam chair. So I oversee um, all three of the exams. If you're not familiar with CCPDT, they currently have three exams that they offer, um, two that are related to training, one that tests knowledge around training and one that tests skills. And then uh, uh, one exam at the moment that tests knowledge around behavior consulting. Um, for those of you who are credentialing junkies, the CCPDT is uh, and has been looking at uh, creating a skills exam for behavior consulting. Uh, we just aren't there yet, so it's in process. Um, currently, the CCPDT is the only accreditation, or it's the only exam that has uh, NCCA accreditation. So we don't have NCCA accreditation for all three of our exams, just the two knowledge exams. Um, the skills exam is going to be really tricky to see if we're ever able to, to find a way to get it accredited because of the nature of the exam, but we're working on it. Um, I can tell you more about the details of the individual exams if you're interested, sort of how they work, but th probably the most important piece to keep in mind about um, the CCPDT exams 
um, because they are accredited, they have that same focus, like a licensure board, on this idea of demonstrating minimum competency. You can't test for excellence. You can only ever gauge minimum competency. So you set a threshold and you say, you know, what is it that you have to know in order to be minimally qualified? Yeah, so that's a lot of jargon I threw at you guys really fast. Um, I have no idea since we're, we're off on uh, the timing, whether I'm over or under, I'm happy to answer questions or you certainly can feel free to email me if you have questions. I hope every single one of you will look into credentialing options and get certified. Uh, the most important thing I think you can do, not just to benefit yourself and your own business, but our whole community is to take the time to invest in certification. We absolutely, I'll, I'll echo what Stevie was saying. I think we all can improve the industry by helping us move towards professionalization. And that means taking the time to understand the difference between different credentials um, and taking the time to jump through, the, through those hoops. So thanks. Thank you so much, Kate. That was wonderful. And there, I think you are host now. And, uh, oh, I think you did uh, Allison, actually. I'm just kidding. Her name <laughs> also starts with an A. It's, an a. it's the bane of the A name. We also get all of the butt dials, too, as I'm sure she'll tell you. I just okay. gave it to you. OK, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you for talking to us about credentialing. Super important. Thank you so much, Kate. Hope you have better luck with your day. <laughs> um, Anne Hendrickson is passionate about dog training and behavior as she is about community and collaboration. She loves training, learning, and being immersed with other behavior nerds and dogs. Probably why she set this up for us. <laughs> Anne spent most of her time immersed in dog packs at downtown dogs. Her staff training methods and infrastructure are used at daycares throughout the nation. She loves her former employees and is proud of how many became excellent dog trainers. She has title dogs in agility, fly ball, obedience, and rally. Anne was the human trainer of Riley the Rally Dog on WCCO TV. Infusing play and social learning into standard obedience classes by Anne Hendrickson. Anne Hendrickson, infusing play and social learning into standard obedience classes. Thank you so much. Um, I have to, I'm recording. Okay, thank you. It, it takes a village, right? Um, okay, so the first question, if you're going to integrate uh, off-leash play into a basic obedience class is why. It's, it is riskier and it's, I will tell you, it is way more exhausting. So why do it? Um, the first reason is it's a great format for young social dogs. We all know the dog where the owner leaves in tears because the whole time the dog won't focus on them. All they want to do is go sniff the other dogs. Um, and a lot of those dogs are very young and developmentally, they can't focus and work for a full hour. They do need those brain breaks and that play break. So it is um, for young social dogs, it can be a much better experience for them and for their humans. Um, what I really like about it is just by virtue of offering them, you're sending a message about focusing on whole dog needs. Um, obedience reliability is key, but it isn't going to take you the full distance on getting the right behaviors and the right bond and giving your dog the best like life that you can. There's, uh, your dog has social needs, enrichment needs. I mean, we're all here today because we know that, but it, this, it sends a better message to the clients. Um, and it teaches humans important social behavior. So often people are bringing their dogs to the dog park. They have no idea what their dog's discomfort looks like. They have no idea what bullying looks like. That even unfortunately can happen in some daycare settings. And the dog for years will be stressed and scared in a pack. And the dog will put up with it for a while. I mean, part of why dogs amaze me is how much they will put up with for how long. They're, they're an incredible species. But eventually they won't. They've been scared and stressed for too long. And they start to preemptively aggress 
aggress or retaliate and start fights. And that's typically when the trainers get the call. And I personally almost never take those clients because it isn't just about that one or two fights that the dog has started. It's about the dog for years learning that they're not safe in a pack. So by teaching humans early on what good social interaction looks like and what good social behavior is, you can preserve that dog friendliness in that dog uh, by giving them those good experiences and then they can have a lifetime with um, a lot more great things in it. Um, and also freedom play and other dogs are huge distractions and huge rewards you know we always are teaching our clients that your biggest distractions are your biggest real life rewards um so being able to kind of put that into practice and help them see beyond just the behavior mechanics is um great life skills so those are the reasons that you might want to consider offering a play integrative class um what does it look like um, different people do it differently um, from ours. We start with a reflection of the week. So when people come in, the dogs are not allowed off leash. They are not even allowed to sniff each other. Um, we really want that impulse control. We want them to wait patiently for that amazing reward of the play and freedom. We don't want them to get it for pulling their human in or pulling on the lead and all of those behaviors we don't like. It's a great chance to show, to get people thinking about um, what does your dog value and did they get it for a behavior you liked or didn't like? And that also would be an example of a reflection we would talk about for just a couple of minutes and they do get to get off leash and have a little bit of greeting time and a play and get their wiggles out they're usually very ready at that point uh, then we come back on leash um, sometimes the dogs can be recalled out of play at that point sometimes not but usually i tell people go get your dog because we don't want the recall to uh, signify the end of the play session um, and we play um after we review the previous week's skills on leash, we go back off leash and practice the skills, whether it's a sit or attention or whatever it is, while the dogs are in the play group. And at this point, they usually have a little better handle or focus because they've had a chance to get their wiggles out. Um, and it helps people see how to how to compete with other dogs and high distractions. Um, then we go back on leash and learn whatever new skill we're doing that evening. And then we practice it off leash with play. So um, there's no right or wrong with this. Uh, some, some people I think do them completely off leash, but I, uh, this is the format that I do. Um, the question people always have is around the risk. How do you keep the play successful? Um, and the first, that starts before any dog has even registered for your class. The first thing is to know what problems are you aiming to solve with this offering and what is the behavioral range of dogs that your class is designed for. Um, you know what problems I'm aiming to solve because I put it on the, the second slide and behaviorally uh, I will take dogs that need some remedial socialization if they're not real reactive or mild leash reactivity is typically uh, not a problem, but you need to know, I know that uh, Jody Carroll also does these and she only takes a really highly socialized dog. She is not there to teach them social skills. So it, there's no right or wrong, but you do need to reflect and identify why are you doing this and what's the behavioral range you take you're going to take and then you market to social dogs within that behavioral range so choosing your words on the marketing making sure you're re reaching the right audience of people whose dogs might be perfect for that um, it's easy to if you market it wrong that people will think it's for reactive dogs that need to learn how to function in a pack or um, things like that. So making sure you're you're really uh, identifying your target dog and marketing to them is part of how you keep play successful. Uh, you need to do some kind of uh, screening or evaluation process. I meet for 15 minutes with people via Zoom. They also fill out a form when they sign up. Um, I've heard of other people doing phone calls. 
I try to get, for one thing, that is your chance to connect with that human and help set the expectations for the class, what they're gonna learn, what it's gonna be like, what their jobs are. Make sure that there's alignment there and you can learn about the dog. I'm really looking basically for their social experience and their confidence level. But if you can tell by uh, that medium that this dog probably isn't gonna be well served by your class, uh, you can deal with it then instead of after they arrive. Uh, and then the other one, Oh, why my next one isn't popping up. There we go. Um, the other thing is you have to have an alternate plan for dogs who will not be well served by your class. Sometimes even with all of your reflecting, your marketing, your screening, someone will still arrive and uh, clearly the dog is not going to be uh, well served for the class. For me, that happens sometimes because of the way my setup is. It's it's really sweet. It's at a dog daycare, but there's chain link fences all around. So sometimes a dog's barrier frustration is more than what it seemed, and it's actually going to be increased in that environment. Uh, stuff happens. Make sure you have a plan that you've communicated during your screening process for if the dog arrives and it's uh, really not going to be the best thing for the dog to be there. Um, the next thing for keeping play successful is when they actually arrive at class. So we've done a lot of pre-work to set things up for success. Um, have a visual posting and discuss the rules of fair play. Uh, for us, the first one is that the goal is comfort and good social skills not the intensity and the frequency of the dog-dog interaction or their play. Some people think that anytime the dog is sitting by them or not interacting, that they're not playing and that they're supposed to be playing. Well, that isn't true. Socialization means you're calm and comfortable in a given social environment. If the dog wants to sniff the perimeter to get their bearings or hang with their human for a bit, that is absolutely okay and that is acceptable social behavior. Um, and people don't, don't really understand that. So making sure they understand um, that what we want is a comfortable, relaxed dog. Um, the next one is, I do not allow any chasing. We trainers know that the majority of the time people think dogs are having fun getting chased and they're actually not. It triggers predation, blah, blah, blah. We know all of that. The clients typically don't care and don't believe you. Um, so what I typically say is it's just too dangerous. It's when they can knock somebody out who is just standing there because the dogs aren't looking where they're going or they go too fast and smash into a fence. and whether they agree or not that the dogs typically don't enjoy it, it's not giving the dog any social benefit. It isn't needed, so we just um, hard no on any chasing. If the dogs start to chase, the people learn the first night how to redirect and interrupt and stop the chasing before the dogs have made a full Zoom loop. By a Zoom loop, I mean when they start that uh, uh, spinning and chase. <laughs> <laughs> running kind of it fast in circles is what I'm trying to say. Um, and then the last one is no packing up. There should never be a situation where there's one dog on the bottom and two dogs on top. Now, when that happens, what do you think the humans do? Well, whoever's dog is on the bottom, they recall that dog. I talk about it before the dogs have ever been off leash. Do not call your dog when two dogs are packing up on them. It's really for us, it's a human social cue to try to tell the other owners that you think your dog is being bullied, but it's not direct enough for the situation. And your dog has two dogs on top of them. They can't come if they want to. So if there is any packing up, the humans of every dog involved need to go over immediately and interrupt, redirect with food. Um, so if the dog is small enough, you can scoop them up, but you need to interrupt and stop the packing up right away and not by recalling the dog on the bottom. So we talk about that. I, I say it a little bit more diplomatically, I guess, when I'm talking to clients, but that's um, those are the, the rules of fair play that we have to keep it successful. Uh, the next thing is your environment is incredibly key in having a successful play group. If you have just a big empty room with mats and all the dogs have to do is chase and think about each other, that is not going to go as well as if you have, um, oh, 
I did it in the wrong order. If you have other enrichment things, um, ramps are great because it will change the dog's height. So a less confident dog can get a height advantage and feel more confident playing. It's good uh, sensories. It, it encourages the humans to teach them how to go up the ramp. So they start to learn how to interact with their dog and be a fun force in a, a group of in an environment where the dog is with other dogs so the dog can start to learn that handle or focus. Um, have multiple play spaces. Uh, I always have at least two groups and sometimes three. We have a, a limit of nine dogs in the class and never do I have nine dogs off leash in the same space. Um, and also break spaces. So nervous dogs have a place that they can uh, that's their space to come back in and out of so they can take self-directed breaks. Um, and other, a refuge for nervous dogs. Uh, sometimes I will set up an X-Pen um, that the nervous dogs often will wanna come to the edge of the X-Pen and explore, but they don't want anyone jumping on them. So if you have a place where they can see and smell and feel and sort of interact with the other dogs but not get jumped on that will give them the time to gather the confidence they need uh, to become comfortable in the environment um, the next thing for keeping play successful um, and again i talked to jody and she does this differently um, that format i told you about uh, where we do the reflection the play learn play that's from night two on. Night one works quite a bit differently. Um, and after everyone arrives, again, without any greetings of any kind, um, dog play and sniffing is a reward. It's not something you just get for running into class. Uh, we do a greeting circle. So everyone stands in a circle. And the first person walks with their dog in the middle of the circle, then the human, then the outside of the circle, if you can envision that. So there's always a human between the two dogs. They introduce themselves and walk their dog in a circle um, all the way around. So every dog gets a chance to sniff each other with a human in between. Then they turn around and walk the opposite direction. So now the dogs are next to each other uh, without a human in between. They need to give themselves enough space that the dog still can't touch. And we talk about how to keep your dog's focus on you during this time, but it gives them a little bit of a closer greeting. So uh, at the end of the greeting circle, all the dogs have sniffed each other multiple times. And the humans have been able to assess if we saw any posturing we didn't like. And I'm also really, um, I typically have the play groups kind of mapped out in my mind before the class even starts, just based on the registration forms and the 15 minute Zoom meeting. But I watch, you can tell a lot when people have to keep their dogs still and calm as we do the greeting circle. Um, and it kind of finalizes my idea of who is going to be in which play group. Um, then I divide the play groups. I do not divide based on size. I do it based on uh, confidence. So um, we divide the groups based on confidence, uh, at least two, if not three, when people, so we say, okay, Pippa, Buddy, and Tubby, you're gonna be over in ring one, and Fluffy, Trula, and Selma are going to be over here in ring two. Uh, they go over and wait where they're separate. Again, the dogs still have not met. And uh, we talk about how this freedom and this off-leash play is a huge reward. Are we going to give it to our dog for pulling on their leash or jumping or trying to drag you over to the other dog? Absolutely not. This is the biggest reward we have at our disposal, and we are going to use it for calm, under control behavior. So we wait till everyone is truly calm. They don't have to be sitting, but I need to see a nice relaxed body and a nice relaxed leash, not a really quick sit to get what you want or the I'm sitting because I want this so bad. Um, we wait for true calm. And I know some of you are thinking, well, some of our dogs, I would take 45 minutes. Um, there's always somebody who takes longer so that gets back to having the right setup. I usually have a place where they can wait behind a different gate so we can get the calm dogs going. Then I go help the person whose dog can't calm down. They're in the different pen at that point. Uh, so I have them take the leash off 
and uh, let, let the dog sniff around and sniff at the door. And as soon as we see some nice, relaxed, calm, we open the gate and that's their reward and they get to go in. So it, it does take longer for some, but the situation you want to avoid is ever having one dog on leash in the pack while the other ones are loose. That A is not going to help the dog calm down. Um, it's a safety issue. It isn't fair to make somebody more vulnerable in the pack. It is just absolutely not okay. Uh, but you don't wanna make everyone wait if, there's, if everyone else has been calm for a reasonable amount of time and somebody else just can't do it. So that's what we're trying to achieve there. Um, and yeah, that's I think what I just talked about, have a separate area. So if there is somebody who can't calm down, you can go work with them. And then that first night, once we have everyone off leash, it um, I am on those play groups like white on rice, watching every interaction until I've gotten to know the dogs and their play style and the dynamic. Um, and then then you can relax a little and chat with the humans and start to narrate what's going on but i am really really dialed into the pack and the play in the beginning so that is and i'm i didn't set my timer i hope that was 15 minutes but that is how i run uh off leash play classes and keep the play successful and i think they're uh really great the, the clients love them so if you do have any questions about anything I said or uh, want to talk further, you can email me or put a shout out on the group. But uh, as you can see, I love to talk about it. Thanks, Anne. Oh, play and we need to have a dog park, send everyone to you for dog park etiquette. <laughs> Don't we wish, right? <laughs> um, could you actually make me the next host? Um, you bet. We had a little schedule change so she'll go after me okay um, so you're gonna be next mm -hmm. okay oh and I get to introduce you right yes please okay um shoot the only thing is that um I actually can't minimize my screen to get the copy that Bailey sent me to introduce her so um I'm very sorry about that but what I will tell you is I'll send it to you in um chat okay um, Bailey has been uh, really instrumental in making this happen. I've been so uh, happy to have you here. And uh, one thing I can tell you is that she likes zombies. I remember that. Um, oh, I think my message was too long. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just go okay. ahead. <laughs> All right. So Bailey uh, is going to, I'm very excited about this presentation. She's going to be talking to us about um, off-leash alternatives and ways to use a long line. Um, and I know all of us struggle with how do we get enough exercise and, and enrichment for some of these dogs. Um, and this summer, Bailey had a dog actually attack her out of nowhere, uh, which got her really, really focused on uh, thinking of uh, harm, harm reduction approach to uh, how people use leashes. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry you didn't get, you gave everyone else these amazing introductions mm -hmm. and you didn't get yours, but this I'm happy you're here and I'm excited to learn. Yeah, thanks, Anne. And I was so happy to see that Elise talk about harm reduction in general before me, because that's exactly the kind of approach I take to a lot of things. I'm hoping I'm doing better and better every year, but especially to leash usage. And so whew, buckle up. I might say some things that are a little bit uncomfortable because sometimes they might be illegal right? Because six foot leash is often the law in the communities that we live in. <sighs> but <laughs> I'm going to advocate for some, some sort of tether that may not be legal. Um, so even though it's uncomfortable, it's I ask you just um, sit with it a little bit. So to me, there's four pillars to increasing leash, leash usage, and in particular, long, long line usage. So the first, we do have to make sure that our clients understand the 
thing, the bad things that can happen. This usually isn't enough to actually make them use a leash. And a lot of folks that aren't currently using leashes, they for some reason think that their dog's life is going to be ruined by being put on a leash. We can walk them through how they can make their lives, their dog's lives still great when they're going to use a leash. If if somebody is off mute, can you pop yourself back on? She can't see and do it herself as she presents. Um, and then the owner experience is the very most important thing. So if it doesn't make their life better, easier, or more fun, they're not going to do it. So we have to make sure that the leash skills and the leash equipment that we're presenting is going to do those things for our clients. And then of course, everyone's gonna have their own special little objections. So I'm gonna talk about the most common ones that I have experienced in my years and how I deal with them. So let's step back a minute. Let's think about a very average owner with a very average dog, just taking a potty walk. So we're not doing anything fancy, no training walk, no hiking walk, nothing like that. And we're just going for, to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so when we're on a six foot leash, usually the dog is kind of right by you and you, assuming you have vision, you can't really see your dog very well. So what happens a lot is they're walking along as a team and then the dog stops to go to the bathroom and the owner's shoulder gets jerked because the dog pulled off to the grass and the owner thinks, oh, bad dog jerks the leash they're supposed to correct their dog right and then the dog doesn't respond and the owner goes oh why aren't you responding and then they look oh you're peeing sorry the fact that there's just less room for the dog to move in means that more of those dog the dog's movements are going to be considered incorrect by the handler and we can't we can't minimize the pain that happens, especially if someone already has chronic pain. A leash walk can be not a good thing. The one thing about short leashes is we don't have to be quite as aware of our surroundings. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. Okay, let's lengthen that leash from six to 15 feet is usually what I like to work with. Usually, we can eliminate pain if we're working with an average dog and for sure we can lessen it. Just no training, just lengthening the leash. There's simply more room for the dog to move within. And so more of those movements are gonna be considered correct. Hardly any of those movements are gonna hurt the owner's shoulder or hands. Um, in addition, when we're on a long line, usually the dog is gonna be kind of right in front of the owner or out far enough that the owner can see, you know, what, where its dog is going. And so the, assuming they have vision, they'll see the dog stop off to pee before they feel it in their shoulder. And so we never get that conflict or the pain. And then their relationship's gonna be better. We're happier about that. The one thing we do have to be more aware of our surroundings, but again, I'll, I'll talk about that later. So the enrichment piece. For the folks that think, oh, my dog pulls because he's naughty. Dogs don't really pull because they're naughty, right? They move differently. And I don't think a lot of our clients know that. They simply have a different gait than we do. And they have to change the way they move drastically to walk nicely with us. If we give them more room, they don't have to change the way they move quite as much and therefore can walk politely more easily. And then for the folks that are worried about ruining their dog's life by using a leash, we can show them how do, they can still do all the dog stuff that they want and doing dog stuff for folks that think that, oh, my dog needs to be in heel doing dog stuff like sniffing that tree that someone just peed on will make them a better house pet if they get their legal doggy things out 
in appropriate manners. And there's all the other enrichment stuff that you guys want to talk about is important too. Okay. One of the first objections I'll hear is, wow, how can I manage that much leash? Whew, I've been walking dogs on a long line for at least 10 years and I've never tripped over my leash. There, of course, we have to watch out for differently abled people and help them in a, a different way. But I'm talking about a very average owner that has full use of their body. One thing that really helps without any training or learning body mechanics is just simply getting a bright orange leash or whatever the owner can really see really well. I like orange because for my very normal vision, it shows up in green grass, dead grass, snow, asphalt, and the sidewalk concrete. And I'm kind of a sloppy leash holder. I, I don't do all that fancy stuff that Grisha Stewart likes to show. I just kind of hold it um, and let the rest of it drag and I, I don't trip. I don't need a leash because my dog already knows. My dog knows how to come and call. My dog knows not to chase things. My dog knows not to attack people. This I usually hear from folks that are trainers or amateur trainers and have hired me as a behavior consultant. And so I'll, you know, I'll, if we need to do some recall work, maybe, maybe. But one thing I think is helpful to bring up to those kind of folks, especially if they do um, like competitions and trials, think about a trial environment. It's your dog has been conditioned through training classes and all the trials you've been at to really know what to expect. Your dog can be, is reasonably sure <laughs> that a random dog isn't gonna just like pop around the corner. The dog is reasonably sure that the judge will be touching him and not that small child running at him from across the football field. And, and in addition, a trial, your dog has to be at his top performance for just a few minutes. And then he can go back to his crate and relax. When we're walking our dogs, it's we usually expect them to be at their top performance for much longer. And I don't think that that's reasonable or fair. And then we never want our clients to be in this situation. Kind of funny but it's really bad <laughs> oh won't won't using a longer line teach my dog to pull in my experience the dog pulls less because they have more room to work with and i also think that some of this uh, some of these ideas come from the anti-flexi lead propaganda which by the way i if people want to use a flexi lead I'm all for that. Let's teach them how to use it responsibly. So with very minimal training, we can get a dog that doesn't, you know, you know, hit the end of the leash and jerk the, the shoulder. So this is Penny. She, well, you guys know how to train dogs, but um, she was like, she wants to run. And so she learned she can just run and she stops at the end of her 15 foot lead. We did this in one walk's worth of training and the problem was solved. See, it's just a nice way to walk. This is the very most common objection <laughs> that I hear. D 
doesn't it bother the dog to have the leash in his way? I have no idea why people think they need to baby their dog and keep the leash out of his way all the time. I mean, some dogs are going to have some sensitivities and we'll have to adjust for that, but I just don't think dogs care about where the leash is. I have a lot of success showing them videos of sled dog teams and those cables get all wrapped around their armpits. They don't care. They're having fun. You can also just show them their own dog not caring about the leash. This is Toby. That leash is all up in his business. This is his tree friend. This is his, his best friend is this tree. I don't, he's a weirdo. You can see he doesn't care about that leash. And if I have a longer line, my dog can get into my neighbor's yard more easily. Yep, that's valid. Again, very minimal training, no food. Some clients don't wanna use food when they're outside and some dogs you know, don't respond to food outside. So minimal training, we can teach the dog, you can, you're free to walk in the boulevard, but if you go in the yard, I'm gonna stop. Boulevard, go. Yard, stop. Boulevard, go. Any, any client can do this. Well, maybe, at least, maybe. <laughs> okay. Is it more dangerous to have your dog on a 15 foot leash than a six foot leash. <sighs> yeah, um, there's more room, right? Your dog is further away from you. Um, but here's my thing. If, if lengthening your line six to 10 feet makes you really nervous, then your dog is probably not actually very safe to be walking anyway. And so we need to be normalizing muzzles for dogs that struggle with reactivity or aggression. And we need to be actually modeling muzzle usage ourselves. So even though I might have a reactive dog that I manage really well and has never, and I believe will never have a bite incident because of my management of this dog and my training, maybe he should have a muzzle on anyway. We're gonna have to be careful about watching our surroundings. Model usage or not non-usage of telephones <laughs> on walks and make it clear that we need to be able to see what's coming and hear what's coming to keep our dog safe. We have to be able to get our dog back from 15 feet. That is gonna be very important. And then, handling skills, which Katie is going to talk to us about. I'm so happy. So make it really clear, like, hey, yeah, you have 15 feet of line. You don't always have to use it. If you're going around a corner when you can't see, shorten that up to four feet and then proceed and hold the leash in a way that is not going to break their hand. In conclusion, I think that long lines or even flexi leads are going to be a good solution to getting people to use leashes in general. Um, an illegal 15 foot line is much safer than a legal six foot line. And so I'm cool with that. We're going to have a better owner experience by reducing pain and frustration. Dog's going to be happier on a longer line than a six foot line. We're going to have fewer disasters and safer neighborhoods. And we wouldn't get to see this if I had been using a six foot leash. <laughs> oh, I love her. I love to talk. Please find me on Facebook or email me. Um, I used up all my time, so I'm sorry. <laughs> and Lindsay, are you ready or Katie? Are you going next? Uh, I am good to go again, but also it might make sense to do Katie's next because long lines and long lines, it's kind of how they originally <laughs> paired up. So 
Um, I will leave it up to you folks, but I'm okay. good for whatever. Katie, are you ready? I oh. am. Okay. I will make you the next presenter and introduce you as soon as I find your name. All right. Katie is a certified professional dog trainer at Possibilities Dog Training. She also is at Veterinary Veter Veterinary Behavior Specialties of Minnesota and has been helping people enjoy their canine family members for almost 10 years. Living life with American Pitbull Terrier, lovingly referred to as Jazz the Spaz, has forced her to improve upon her management and training strategies. I know what that's like. <laughs> Leash training is one of her favorite things to teach as she feels it can provide immediate help for owners who want to enjoy a stroll with their dogs. Leash walking is one of the most common obedience related complaints among dog owners. Teach your clients about management techniques and foundational skills that can turn dog walks from a chore to cooperative adventures. Release the hounds by Katie Kelly. Katie Kelly, release the hounds. <laughs> All right, well, let's see. Um, thank you for that introduction, Bailey. And let's see. Um, okay, well, maybe I should have changed that. I apologize. Stop sharing. Um, present that. Put it in presentation form first. Right? Am I still on mute? I thought, That's no, what I did. I thought that you have to um, um, share before presentation mode because you can't get back to the share button. But yeah, okay. Um, sorry. So if I. I just I think it will work if you just hit present now. Oh, and I see it. Right. I didn't realize I had. Okay. <laughs> I'm new to the screen sharing thing. I just learned that I think this week. So it's awesome. Um, yes, thank you for the introduction. So this is a little different than uh, Bailey's, but not um, anything I advocate um, differently. I actually think, um, you know, I probably walk my dogs on long lines most of the time. So uh, I, lo I love those points. And I think those are very, um, it's a very great thing to consider when you're talking to clients about leash walking their dogs. Because, um, you know, it's just, it can be a lot more enriching than just sitting on a six foot leash. Um, but what about those times where we have to have our dogs on a six foot leash? And because of the legalities or the situation that calls for it, um, I do, as Bailey said, I do have a little bit of an inspiration. So uh, Jasmine, I got her about seven years ago and, um, you know, she was really hard on hardware, as you can see, um, she's given me some injuries. And at one point she did put me in the hospital as I woke up um, with and couldn't move from a severe back spasm. <laughs> so that um, made me, it forced me to figure out how to safely handle the leash so that um, my body wasn't put in uh, more uh, harming circumstances and so that everyone was kept safe and our walks could be more enjoyable. Uh, so tools, there are um, no pull harnesses. I mean, I think we're all kind of um, familiar with these tools, um, but the no pull harnesses and gentle leaders, um, I usually like to talk about uh, how they redistribute the um, weight of the dog, um, because a lot of people will think that harnesses cause dogs to pull and things like that. Um, and we know that nopal harnesses are different um, due to their design um, and how it redistributes that weight of the dog. Um, as same with the gentle leaders as well. The issue as we probably all came across is that gentle leaders are not always the easiest to apply for owners um, due to the fact that they can 
um, be aversive without proper conditioning. Um, and then martingales for those that slip the collar, uh, four to six foot leash when necessary, but um, long lines as Bailey was talking about are great tools to help dogs have um, less room for error. So it gives them a lot more ability to uh, understand how to keep a leash loose and gives them that, um, that benefit of kind of getting that freedom and that more mental enrichment. Uh, treat pouch, uh, those are for convenience purposes, but as you can see with the picture of my brother, uh, they can also add flair to your style. Um, and then high value rewards. Um, I like to have kind of a trail mix um, depending on how well your dog, um, you know, does with different foods. But I like to have a, a variety due to the fact that our dogs can get bored of, of things. Um, so it kind of keeps it interesting. And you can also infuse your kibble with some of those higher value things as well. So leash handling. Um, what I like to do is I have the handle either on my wrist or on my thumb. And so I give this option to the owners. Um, and what I say is usually if you're concerned about losing your dog, uh, you could have the leash handle on your wrist because you kind of have that natural block of your hand um, from coming undone. If your concern is more about your dog's gonna pull you over and, and cause you to fall and get hurt, um, and you'd rather be able to just drop the leash at that moment, um, then go ahead and put it on your thumb because then you can easily let go of the leash and the leash would be out of your hand. Then I also talk about having a leash lock and I'll show you what that looks like in this video, but I take some of the slack and I put it over my pointer finger and then make a fist around it um, so that I can control the slack and control how much leash my dog has and um, whether I want it shorter or longer for that particular situation. I also hold my leash at my belly button. So that gives me more leverage um, as it's my center of gravity. So it's easier for me to keep um, stable. The times that I've been pulled over is because my arm has gone outwards. So your free hand then, um, cause this is all on one hand, your free hand then would be able to use for rewards or if you need to, you can um, gain more leash. Um, so if you need to kind of relock, you can use your free hand to gain more leash and relock to have less slack for the dog. Um, you can also use your free hand just to give you more of that leverage um, so that you're keeping your um, leash hand at your belly button as much as you can so your dog doesn't pull it away from you. And then um, one of the things that I found really helpful for the back spasm issue is how I'm working with my legs. So my legs should be square, slightly bent at the knees. Um, and then I like to have a leading leg. So I have one leg that at base that kind of keeps me stable. And then I have a leg that will follow the leash wherever it goes. And so my dog who was a spaz, um, when she would get crazy, it was, it was just spazzing moments all over the place. And I'm pretty sure that's probably what caused my back to go into a spasm is because um, my back was getting pulled all different ways and with her force at the end of it. Um, so this goal is to keep the back nice and straight regardless of where your dog is pulling. And then um, owners have their own habits already and I want to make sure that they're aware of this because if they feel like they have to remember this every single time, um, it's gonna be harder for that buy-in. But I talked to them about how we, we already, we all create habits. Most of them is we just wrap the leash around our hand a billion times. Um, so I just talk about how if we practice, it may take some attention to it the first few times you do this, but eventually this starts to become your new habit with, with leash handling. Um, so I don't go through kind of all of this in this little video, but it shows you kind of what I mean. So it's either on the, the wrist or the thumb. I make that leash lock. I keep it at my belly button. My free hand is for rewards, or if I need to gain that extra leash and relock my leash lock. 
And that was really fast, but it'll break down a little bit more in the next slide. Um, so when it comes to training dogs to walk on a six foot leash, it's a lot harder as Bailey was talking about, cause a lot of frustration. And so for those that need that, um, those leash walks, we need to break it down for them so that the dog is set up to be successful and the owner is set up to be successful. So the first thing I taught, I do with teaching dogs um, to walk on a four to six foot leash is um, a method that I call loose leash standing. And what this does is it teaches the dog that the leash is a cue. So if they feel the leash on their chest, nice and loose, that should be a green light for them that they can keep going. And if the leash gets taut, that will be kind of like a green, uh, a red light. Did I say that backwards? Green light if it's loose, red light if it, if it gets taut, they know, whoops, I gotta fix something. Um, and by teaching the dog that the leash is a cue, that gives the dog the ability to make these choices on their own so that the, the owner doesn't have to step in. Um, it makes for the walks to be more enjoyable because the, the dog can make those choices on their own um, rather than the owner having to use the leash as a tool to get the dog to be loose again, um, which is frustrating for, for both the owner and the dog. Um, then I go into moving attention. So after we've taught the dog that the leash is a cue, that to keep it loose, it's gonna give them rewards. I, I actually teach a lot of moving attention um, where we're backing up and the dog is just following your movement. So I have the owner move backwards um, and we, we mark a reward for that dog following that client's movement. Um, I like starting off here because the dog has a focus um, rather than moving forward where the dog has um, so many other focuses uh, instead and makes it a lot more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's harder for the dog to comprehend exactly what's going on. So here we have an, an exact focus and something to do um, and breaks it down just a little bit more for the dog. And then what we can do is we can start turning forward as if we're gonna go for a walk and this gives us the chance to reward for position. Now I'm not one to suggest clients make sure their dog is right at their side because that's not fun for anybody and it's it's not really realistic. I usually tell them as long as the dog isn't pulling your arm off, that should be a good goal. Um, so, but I think it's a great place to just give that dog um, kind of a goal to be around and just, it makes it easier for that dog to stick with you. Um, when we're moving backwards, I turn a reward right at my pants. So they kind of make that association of where those rewards are gonna come from. Um, and then I tell them to kind of have a game. So we have a high rate of reinforcement and a lot of owners really wanna get away with minimal rewards. And so I create a game out of it of, let's reward the dog as much as you can so that the dog doesn't get the chance to pull. We're not waiting till the dog pulls, but we're going to do as much rewarding so that the dog doesn't get a chance to pull. And then I also talk about um, how sniffing is very important for dogs on their walks and that um, at the end of the day, the walk should really be a, a more about the dog. Um, and if you need more physical activity, those can be on your own, but a lot of walks should be kind of geared, creating some of that mental enrichment for the dog. So allowing them to go sniff. But there are a lot of times where I have owners say, well, I, I let them sniff and then they don't ever come or I can't get them to move with me or move on. Um, and so if owners find themselves in that situation, we also talk about having a go sniff and let's go cue. Um, so that the dogs, there's a lot of clarified communication of allowing the dog to go sniff. And then when it's time to go, that they know that they can move on. Um, so I create cues for that dog to have a smooth adventure. Um, I let them go sniff. And then I teach the owners to reward generously um, when the dog comes to let's go. And you know, usually you have to wait for a while those first few times. You let them go sniff and you say, let's go. When the dog finally decides to let's go, we're rewarding generously for that. So this is a little video. It's not the greatest video. I made it kind of randomly with Lindsay Kinney, who's <laughs> coming on shortly um, at the probably the worst time, but it was just some time that we were together. And... Our stuffed 
this leash walking is just learning how to handle the leash correctly. First, I come through the loop, I bring up the leash, loop it around my index finger, and in between my index finger to my middle finger, hold it tight to my belly button to give me greatest control, as that is my center of gravity. The next step is to teach the dog that the leash is the cue through an exercise that I call loose leash standing. Now that I have my leash set up, I'm going to click and reward Jasmine anytime her leash is loose. Um, In the beginning, I'm going to be very generous with clicking and treating at a rapid rate so that my dog is set up for success. Clicker is not necessary. Tight, I'm going to plant my feet and wait for my dog to make the correct decision to make the leash loose again, which restarts our fun game. This exercise teaches the dog that the leash acts as a physical cue. Once this is learned, any time the dog feels any tension in the leash, he or she will want to ease up, as good things happen when the leash feels loose. Next, we want the dog to pay attention to our movement. I start by moving backwards. This way, it is easier for me to maintain Jasmine's attention when surrounded with distractions. Here, I'm clicking and rewarding movement in the direction that I'm headed. Now, let's start moving forward. I'm going to start off with the moving attention exercise, moving backwards and maintaining Jasmine's attention. Then, I will turn forwards as if to start our walk. Once Jasmine reaches my pant leg, I'm going to click and reward. This exercise helps give me a head start so that I can capture her position at my side before she has the chance to pull ahead. Now that I have taught Jasmine to stick by my side, we can begin our walk. In the beginning, I will click and reward Jasmine at a rapid rate for sticking by me so that she is set up for success. This helps her to make the right choice regardless of the distractions. Eventually, as she understands this concept, I can begin to vary the rate at which I reward her. If the leash were to become tight, I will revert back to the loose leash standing exercise and plant my feet and wait for my dog to make the correct decision. You can use other rewards besides food on your walks. Your dog will especially love the opportunity to check out the environment, as the nose is the way they see the world. It is important to know what your dog wants to work for in that moment. It may be food, it may be a toy, and it may be an enjoyable sniff of the mailbox. If your dog starts pulling on the leash, this is a signal to you that he or she needs more help. Increase the rate at which you are rewarding your dog for Okay, how do I get back to? presentation uh, um so you I, what i was saying is you don't need um you don't need a clicker but a, a verbal marker might be helpful to to let the dog know exactly what you're marking in that time so um letting that that client know that um so when we're taking it on the road as with any behaviors we want to think about distance duration and distraction um, but I start with having my clients keeping it close to home um, and keeping it short. So that's just to decrease the frustration for the owner. Um, if, the, if it starts getting hard, I don't want the owner to feel like they, um, you know, just allow that pulling until they get home because it's just too frustrating. Um, but it can also help the dog kind of generalize that environment and it can, keeping it short can increase that motivation. However, the, the biggest thing when I, the objection I get with that is owners who talk about their dog needing a lot of exercise. Um, and so we know that there's alternative forms of exercise that aren't um, necessary for walking and, and mainly walking on a four to six foot leash is mostly for um, some mental enrichment and some mild exercise, but it's not really going to meet their physical requirements. So things like the flirt pull or fetch or some training games or um, those other things can be beneficial for physical exercise while keeping those walks short. And then integrating that distraction once the fluency is in, you know, there's fluency in that setting. Um, so another thing I like to teach clients is the give me a break game. And this helps to create motivation to pay attention to the owner versus the environment, but it also allows for the dog to check out the environment. And that's really important for dogs who are environmentally insensitive, environmentally sensitive, as well as um, that's just natural behavior. We need to check out our environment. We're, we're moving in somewhere. Um, so 
I'm going to kind of skip ahead with this video because it's not necessary to be that long. So this is a great game to play when you're going into um, new environments that are really exciting for the dog, but it can, al it can also be great for um, any novel environment or any environment that your dog might be sensitive to. I tend to do this a lot too at trials um, for my dog so that um, during the trial, she feels like she's gotten a sense of the um, environment, um, but that her focus on me is more rewarding for her after a while. So there I moved, we were getting too close to that woman and I didn't wanna be disrespectful to her. So I wanted to make sure that was clear to clients. But notice how there's a change in Jasmine's attention to me um, versus in the beginning. Playing this game, allowing her that chance to go sniff things um, ends up allowing for her to be able to attend to me. It also shows me how she's comfortable so that I know we can move forward with, with training. Um, so this is kind of a nice thing I like to show my clients is, oh, I don't know why it's doing that, is, you know, in the beginning, the environment is really exciting and maybe you're not so exciting, but if we give them that chance um, that we can put the environment in our favor and the environment tends to be less exciting compared to us. Um, and pause that. I'll go back to loosely standing. This is exactly where I'll start. Um, have owners start here at the beginning of each walk to kind of um, set those parameters and remind the dog of, of you know, the expectations. But sometimes that I have owners where this is just the goal. Um, they go somewhere, um, they take the dog out into a new environment, they do some give me a break, they do some loosely standing, and then they go home. And just keeping that, um, that training successful. So distractions, um, how to work with those uh, for our clients and um, especially for really excitable dogs and our really strong dogs. Um, so treat scatter, just literally throwing food on the ground. Moving find it's is just treat scatter on the move. So I believe this is the treat scatter on the move. So that way you can keep moving, especially if your dog um, needs that to just get by that distraction quickly. Um, especially if the distraction is more stabilized and it's not gonna, it's not gonna go by you. Um, where the treat scatter could be, could be fine if a dog's walking by you, but if you're trying to get by maybe a fenced in dog, then you can do a uh, moving find it um, so you can move past it easier. The other thing is a, is a treat hand or some people call it a Kong hand. This is a way to, to another way to just go from A to B, um, getting the dog to go by a distraction in a successful way and I want to make sure to tell the clients this is not a way to lure your dog. Um, we aren't tricking our dog to come with us and the dog should be eating from our hand the entire time we're moving. Um, the problem is, is sometimes we'll run out of food um, before we're past the distraction. So we go to this tree scatter. If I feel that my hand is getting um, close to being empty, I'll tree scatter those while I can reload my hand. Um, so here's an example of that. I don't need the sound. So my treat placement is probably a little high for Jasmine. She's got to kind of reach up. Lindsay will touch on treat placement later. Um, so that kind of gets you from A to B. I really like that, especially for clients um, when we are in vet clinics uh, back, you know, when the pandemic is over. I really like that for clients who need to get their dog from the car to the exam room and usually in really tight spots. Um, and then pre-MAC, 
um, as we know, you can use things, you can use those distractions as rewards if those dogs are really um, excited about those rewards, we can use it for advantage. Um, and body blocking when necessary. So it can be helpful to maintain control. Um, is, is it always appropriate? Uh, no, but it can, it can be necessary if you need to help, the owners need help to maintain control. Uh, it can be necessary for safety purposes if you have to get in between your dog and something else. Um, or you can other, use other visual barriers if you need to, to like a parked car or things like that if your dog um, needs that decrease in visual stimulation. And so um, this is really quick, but basically I slide up on that leash. So I talk, I break this down for the owners that I'm gonna slide up on the leash. You need to make that leash short so that the dog can't get around you. If you don't make the leash short, the body blocking is kind of, it's really ineffective. Um, so I talk to them about that. And then when I move in front of the dog, I make sure to tell the clients that you need to make sure that you have control and then when you're done, you can use a free hand to grab some, some treats for your dog. There's a point in which I have my, um, my rewards a little high. And so Jasmine's excited by that. And um, she leans up to get them, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not hanging her. So <laughs> just make that, just realize that distinction. Um, so I turn in front, I have her with one hand and then I feed. Um, so, just kind of helping the clients to realize that you need to make that leash short and then stand in front, make sure you have control um, before releasing your hand and then you can feed them that time. Moving slowly. Oh, wants to go through the videos. Um, so if you have any questions on leash walking or um, if you want any other examples that we haven't gone through today, you can certainly email me at kkellycpdt at gmail.com. Um, and you can also check me out on Facebook at Dog Training with Katie Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Could you toss the host over to Lindsay? Mm hmm Oh, thank you. I am... Um... I think I actually took uh, on a little class from you when I was bored at the beginning of lockdown. <laughs> yes, I, yes. You're very um, good at this type of stuff. So Lindsay Kinney started training dogs professionally since 2016. Her special interests in the dog community include reactivity, impulse control, rally, tricks, and cooperative care. Before she was a crazy dog lady, Lindsay was a crazy swing dance lady, and her favorite dance is the Lindy Hop. Her favorite show is Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and it's been said that if Lindsay were a dog, she would be a staffy bull. Treat Placement and Body Mechanics by Lindsay Kinney. Lindsay Kinney, Treat Placement and Body Mechanics. All right. Oh, am I hosting now? I am? Yes, maybe. Probably. Okay, close enough for the government. So hello, um, I am super excited to talk about this. Oh, this is so weird. I can't see you guys anymore. Uh, it's, I have never done a, wait, did I even tell it to screen share? I did not. Wow, so talented, so good with technology. All right, screen shares ago. Now you guys can see and I haven't just blinded myself. All right, um, so I tend to ramble quite a bit. So I try to make this one short and now I'm just like, oh no, what if I made it too short? But I'm pretty sure I'll ramble enough to get through all of my time. So here we go. And I got a little timer going because I'm so professional. Um, also, I did not have any like crazy emergency come up. I had just scheduled food to come, um, what I thought was gonna be after my presentation. And then it turns out the food was gonna come in the middle of my presentation. So that's why I was like, Bailey, go first. So now I have a belly full of mac and cheese. All right, and I'm so happy that all of this has been recorded for posterity. This would be a great. All right, uh, so um, 
This is one of the topics that makes my geeky little heart oh so happy, just watching how placing um, your reward is going to affect how, oh no, I have a thing, chat, did I do something wrong? Oh, okay. Um, I'll stop listening to chats now. Um, so um, I just I love how based on where you place the reinforcement for the dog, that's going to affect their entire muscular system and their skeletal system. And so you can really fine tune uh, what's going on, how to get those positions a little bit cleaner. Um, this very much applies to the world of sports, but in this presentation, my focus is going to be on um, catching a lot of common um, client handler mistakes. Um, the quicker you're able to recognize why the behavior isn't turning out the way it is, the quicker you can fix it. Um, so I have a couple common, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple common mistakes. Um, that I see come up a lot um, when I'm just walking around, uh, checking in on my clients where I'll be like, oh, that's not quite right. And the reason it's not quite right is because some way that they've placed it is um, counterproductive to the end goal behavior. But I could talk about this for so much longer. Oh, oh no, how do I go? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Go back. Ha <laughs> Um, so basically, um, what I want you guys to keep in mind throughout this presentation is wherever you place the lure, um, you're essentially going to be controlling the nose. Once you control the nose of the dog, that also controls the neck. The neck connects to the larger spine. And for a lot of our lure type behaviors, um, the dog's going to want to return to a baseline of having a straight spine. They don't like to stick with their spines crooked in a lot of behaviors. So you're gonna wanna keep that in mind um, is how can I manipulate um, the spine in order to get the spine to wanna go back to a baseline that's going to meet uh, my target behavior, my end goal behavior. Um, so that's going to primarily affect things like the hips and then also the elbows. The elbows are also really important. Um, and that has to do a little bit more with um, the vertical distance um, is going to affect the elbows a lot. And then um, pushing into the dog or pulling out is also going to um, control the elbows a lot. And then um, the nose back and forth, neck back and forth is going to primarily affect the hips. So yay. We get to talk about this stuff. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is those neck movements. So the hips move inversely to the neck. So if I have a dog and um, so treats on nose, if I have my dog move their neck to the left, now we have angulation in the spine. Um, the spine's curved. It's going to want to return to baseline. The front paws are probably going to stay in place and the hips are going to move out. So um, if I move the nose to the left, the hips are going to move to the right um, to return to that baseline position. Um, and then uh, going to the right is opposite. Um, also, the nose is another one that we really want to focus on with our clients, uh, you guys know this from teaching sits to dogs if you used um, lure based uh, mechanics. Uh, puppies are like teeter totters, one end goes up, the other end goes down. So if I want my dog to sit, treat on nose, make them look up at the ceiling and that's going to direct um, the hips to go to the ground. Um, and then if I want my dog's hips to come back up or if I don't want the hips to go down, um, I want the chin to tuck a little bit. Um, I see this a lot with um, clients trying to do things if they're trying to get their dog into um, a down position or a standing position or uh, when clients try to teach their dog spins. Um, if their treat placement is too high and that nose is up as they're trying to lure their dog into a spin, the dog's trying to sit as they're doing the spin because the nose is pointed up and they do these awkward little like butt scooches on the ground in a circle. Um, and it's super hilarious and delightful, but not the target behavior that we're looking for. Um, 
<clears throat> so I'm going to show a super short video of um, demonstrating some of these neck movements with my dog Rosie to accentuate some of them. I'm going to be having her on um, a pivot bowl. Also, um, rule of thumb, whenever we see Rosie on the screen, we go, oh, she is so cute because we love her because she's perfect. Uh, the best little Rosen Bosen. So I want you guys to be prepared for that um, so that you know what to do. So without further ado, uh, we are going to start this video, hopefully. Three, two, one, last time. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, neck movements right and left. So um, you can see I turn her head one way, her hips are going to go the other. Lovely. Um, you'll see that she's naturally going to uh, return to a baseline straight spine by reorienting back on me and the hips go back. And now we have our sit, so nose goes up, hips go down. And now I want her to return to stand, tuck the chin, hips pop out. Nose goes up, hips go down, and then, or she's going to pop up on her own anyway. And again, she looked down at my treat pouch, chin went down, so she went down. So yeah, that's just the basics of um, neck movements. Um, so you want to apply this to other things. I see some chats coming in, and I just have too much ADD to leave those as is, so I need to look at them. Maybe, oh no, or I can't see them. All right. Well, hopefully I'll address those later. Um, oh, wait, oh, there's no, God, it's like playing whack-a-mole. Like the chat thing pops up just for a minute. I'm like, oh, click on it. And then it goes back down and then I can't make it come back up. It's fine. Um, also, whenever you are doing um, hind end awareness with the pivot bowl type things, um, watch the um, elbow angulation. That's really important. Um, typically, I want the dog's legs to be straight out from the floor. Um, I essentially want the legs to be making uh, basically a 90 degree angle. Um, if I'm pushing the treat too far into the dog, then that's going to cause their elbow to bend a little bit, and that's going to be harder to get those hip movements to the sides, those side steps um, that we're looking for. So um, basically, if I want rotation in the back hips, I want to make sure that I am keeping uh, the front legs straight into the ground. So straight legs is one of our goal points. All right. Um, so now I'm going to start talking about, um, now that we know kind of those principles of how the mechanics of dogs move when following a lure and how we want to control that neck movement, um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the common things that I see just in basic obedience classes with clients. Um, so oftentimes if I see a client starting with a dog in a sit position and they're trying to do a down, um, you know, the basics is put the treat on the nose and you bring it to the floor and the dog follows the treat down to the floor. That's good. Uh, we want that. What I tend to see happening a lot, though, is the client starts with the treat on the nose and then rather than bringing it straight down, they bring it down at an angle, um, kind of like an arc. Um, so their hand, rather than going straight down, it tends to pull back towards them. Oftentimes I see uh, their lure hand, rather than um, staying out at an angle, it tends to end up near their ankle. And because they haven't kept the lure on the plane of the dog's nose, and they haven't kept that in place, they end up pulling the dog forward into a stand position. Um, and so, um, uh, if I see dogs working on a down a lot, oftentimes it's that um, they've pulled the dog forward um, or that they're luring um, a little bit too quickly. And we'll see this with small dogs in just a bit. So I just wanted to do a quick demo of what I typically see um, with that being pulled out of position. So treat on nose, we start to go down, but oh no, I pulled it towards my ankles and that pulls my dog into a stand. So once more with feeling treat on nose and we pull towards the angle and that pulls the dog up. Um, all right. Oh, no, there we go. Um, so with uh, the down, oftentimes I want to see, can I, oh yeah, I beat the whack-a-mole game. I'm so happy. <laughs> um, oh, that wasn't Hazel. Um, 
that is a uh, moose. She's a Pyrenees, but um, Hazel does very much act like it. All right, perfect. So no questions yet. All right, um, so uh, with the down, oftentimes um, if I'm doing it from a sit position, my first target goal is going to be to um, teach the dog to keep their hips on the ground. Uh, if I'm starting from a sit position, um, I might be doing it down from a standing position, more of a um, bow or a folding down, but I would think it'd be getting obedience class. Um, and my typical pet dog owners don't need to know how to do those fancier downs. Um, so I'm gonna wanna keep the hips placed on the ground and I'm gonna want to, while maintaining those hips, bring the head lower. But as we discussed earlier, oftentimes head going down does trigger the dog to pick their hips back up. Um, so I'm gonna need to convince the dog that please keep your butt on the ground while lowering your head. So I'm gonna really focus on that um, and building in some angulation with the elbows. All right, so here we go. Maybe, maybe, there we go. So again, um, I'm just bringing the head down a little bit. You can see we're starting to get some angulation in the elbows. If the dog stands up, no big deal. Which is um, slowly building that lovely. And then, oh, head went down, so we came up. Um, it's the same thing, just from a slightly different angle. So you can see that bend in the elbows that we really like. Good job. And then I decided to start building um, some duration for the down um, because now that I've got the dog down, as that head comes back up, the dog might want to break position, go forward to the food. So now I'm just training them to um, stay in place and to no longer follow the lure. Um, I'm doing a couple high place lures. Um, and teaching the dog to ignore those. And that's Simon. Oh, he's so cute. So yeah. All right. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh, yay. I got it. I beat the whack-a-mole game. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, the small dogs are notorious notorious for their butts popping up. Um, so it's important to split that down. Um, all right, so here is the other one that I wanted to uh, spend some time on is getting dogs into heel. Um, again, I'm going at this with more so um, pet dog training. So it's again, gonna be more um, lure based, not quite a fancy swing finish into heel necessarily. Um, just when I see owners trying to work on loose leash walking, what I see a lot of the time is the owner, they want the dog real close. And so what they're going to do to get the dog real close for heel is they're going to place the treat directly at the pant seam. And depending on the angle that the dog is coming in at, this is going to get the dog to turn their head to the right, assuming the dog is healing on the left. So they turn their head to the right. And what's that going to do for the heel, uh, for the hip position, if the dog hasn't been trained, um, like I was just training Simon in the last video to, all right, now I have you in position, I want you to kind of ignore some of those lured behaviors um, and still do the desired target behavior. Uh, so if I have a dog that's turning their head to the right while going into heel position, that's going to pop those hips out to the left and then the dog's going to be um, very wide out. Um, I see a lot of dogs like do, going into heel at like 90 degree angles like the owner's facing forward and the dog is just like perpendicularly staring into their pants seam um, and the hips are very out of place which I don't necessarily mind that with client dogs. Um, it's oftentimes something I'm not going to address unless I can tell that the client's getting frustrated, like they want the dog to do heel the right way and the dog's not, and they'll be like, all right, so the problem is our treat placement's a little bit wonky. If we uh, just titch it just a little bit, then you'll get that nice parallel heel um, that you're looking for. So um, again, we wanna be mindful of that placement, how we're having the dog um, turn their head. Um, if uh, my dog is getting into position um, nice and I don't need to switch anything. I'm going to maintain that by feeding straight ahead and maintaining straight spine. Um, sometimes uh, dogs, as they're getting into heel position, those hips might be wide to begin with. 
So then I'm going to fix that by um, getting my dog to actually face away from me. And that's going to tuck the hips in closer to me. And then once I have the hips in the position I like, I can maintain that. So we'll see. Go, 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 Amy. Please, technology. There we go. All right. Uh, so first we'll see feeding near a pant seam. So again, I don't really care where my dog is starting from, but if I'm feeding at the pant seam, um, that's gonna get those hips really wide. And it's so gross and I hate it. Um, again, if my, especially if my dog is coming in at a wider angle or more for a, from a frontier angle, that's gonna be trickier. Um, now I have my dog a little bit more behind so um, now it's okay. Um, it's hard to see from this angle, but her hips are still a little bit wide from um, turning in. But if I feed from the outside and you'll see, I do tend to lure her in close initially, and then I get those hips to turn in. And now she's facing the same direction as me. Uh, we are nice and parallel and I love that. Good job, Rosen Bosen. She's so cute. Skin, toss a reset cookie. Bring her in close initially, turn those hips out to get her the way I want her facing. And then just from a different angle, again, feeding to the outside, gets that beautiful rotation on those hips, gets her nice and parallel to me. We love that though, we still need to work on head position. Um, so oftentimes I do like the clients um, to feed and you can see it here. Uh, my, tr my hand is actually placed on the outside of her face um, just because I find that tends to get that placement, um, that head turn, those hips tucked a little bit more nicely. Um, and I oftentimes feed from um, a hole in my pinky um, or I'll keep the treats um, kind of pinched in my finger and use flat fingers um, along my dog's face to help control head movement. Um, in this particular case, I just was going with easy handful of treats. Um, so if I have multiple treats in hand, um, I'll just feed Kong hand styled. If I have just um, <clears throat> one treat, I'm gonna be feeding with more of a pinched okay sign um, flat on the side of my dog's face. And then oftentimes placing my hand on the outside of the dog's head to keep them uh, nice and straight and just help control that movement. All right, and that's it. And uh, you guys don't get my contact info. You're gonna have to like hunt me down like a bounty hunter or something. Uh, Cause I'm off the grid. No, I'm not. All right. Um, so, and that is it for time. I only went just a little bit over. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm not um, very good at treat placement, so it's very helpful for me to <laughs> hear someone talk about it. <laughs> Could you toss the post over to Allison? I will do my best. Allison Laminin has a whole bunch of letters. Um, CTC, CSAT, P, C, B, C, A. She's a 2016 graduate of Jean Donaldson's Academy for Dog Trainers where she earned her certificate in training and counseling. She studied under the renowned Melina Demartini Price, author of Treating Separation Anxiety and Dogs to obtain her certification in separation anxiety training in 2016. Earlier this year, Allison obtained her PCB CA through the Pet Professional Accreditation Board. Through her studies, Allison has committed herself to using only the kindest and most efficient methods with her clients and their dogs. She dedicates herself to continued education and keeping up on research. Very important. In addition, Allison is Fear Free certified and works at a vet clinic once per week. Helping dogs is just what fills her cup and she's so grateful to have the opportunity to do so, both behaviorally and medically. Early intervention can be a crucial part in the successful resolution of separation anxiety. She's gonna talk about the, her top five things clients can do if they suspect their dog has separation anxiety. Separation anxiety, early intervention by Allison Laminen. Allison Laminen separation anxiety, early intervention.
right. Thank you, Bailey. Just getting my screen. Oops, that was the wrong button. There we go. All right. Um, yeah, as, as Bailey said, I'm Allison. Um, I have been training professionally for about four, well, almost five years now. Um, before that, I was um, engulfed in studies because I'm very studious, or I like to be at least. So uh, I am going to be talking about separation anxiety a little bit today and how people can intervene early uh, and, and just kind of give some easy things that they can do, maybe not super easy in some regards, but um, some things that people can do to uh, make this a little bit easier on them and their dogs. Um, so... There we go. Okay, so a little about me, like she said, I, I have um, four certifications uh, and I'm a member of the Pet Professional Guild. Um, I, I have currently one dog here uh, in, the, in the center. Can you guys see that little blue circle? Awesome, cool. I've never used Canva for presentations, but it gives a blue circle, which is nice. Um, and so this little girl in the middle, this is my current dog, Ahsoka. She's a seven month old American Pitbull Terrier cross. And um, she is awesome, but <laughs> exhausting. Uh, I love her. And then over here is Augie. We just lost him this year. Uh, he is what got me into dog training. And he was the smartest little guy in the whole entire world. He actually took a class with Lindsay last year. Um, we didn't end up getting to finish it due to some family stuff, but he that was his start to nose work. So she got him into that. Um, and then Valentino here, uh, he was... Um, what got me into separation anxiety. So kind of like uh, like everybody in, in dog training, there's usually um, some sort of dog or um, experience they've had that's got them into it. So those are mine. Um, all right. So what is separation anxiety? Um, there's, there's, I guess, two main categories of separation anxiety. We kind of call it all separation anxiety just because it's a little bit easier. But I think it is important to um, just define what the, the different categories might be. And so what most dogs experience is actually something called isolation distress where they just, they can't be alone. Being alone is really scary for them. Um, as long as a person is with them, it's, they're totally fine, um, but they, they just can't be alone. Um, whereas clinical separation anxiety is um, more referring to a dog who cannot be away from a very specific person or, um, you know, couple of people. I can't be away from my mom or my dad or my brother. Um, there, there are people that I cannot be um, separated from or I will panic. Um, so like I said, most dogs are experiencing isolation distress. Um, regardless, the approach that uh, we see SATs take is all the same. And so a lot of people ask what causes separation anxiety. And I think it's important to really highlight that we don't know with 100% certainty. We have an idea based on what we know about dogs and the risk factors and histories that we've taken, um, but to actually research the causes of separation anxiety and to intentionally give a dog separation anxiety would be extremely inhumane. Um, so so those, those studies aren't out there from, um, you know, from a, an intentional standpoint, but we do have um, history from, you know, the countless number of dogs who have had a, um, a, an experience with this. So things that might influence a dog's um, development of separation anxiety might include genetics. Right? So a dog might be predisposed to it genetically. It could be something that um, the, the, um, the breeding mom and dad were, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't use all the technical uh, lingo there, but breeding mom and dad, uh, there, there's some sort of um, separation anxiety in the lines there that, that gets passed on to the kids, of course. We have learned experiences or lack of experience, um, medical influences. So many dogs who have separation anxiety might also have some sort of underlying medical condition. Um, for example, I, um, I, I worked with a dog who um, we, we got stuck at about the three hour mark. And she was pretty tough in the beginning, like her, um, her anxiety was, was really challenging to overcome right away, but we had gotten to like this really nice groove, things were smooth sailing, and then about three hours, and she just couldn't get above it, and we come to find out she was incontinent, 
And she was a young dog. She was less than a year and a half. And so this wasn't something that was on our radar until they started noticing the urine spots on the couch. And they, they found out she's incontinent, um, very likely spay incontinence, and they got her on meds and she started to make more improvements. And so there are, um, there are medical influences that can, in, or that, that can impact a dog's ability to be alone. Um, uh, and so we want to make sure to be connecting with a veterinarian uh, if, if there is any kind of concern for separation anxiety, especially sudden onset. Uh, but I'll talk about that um, uh, in inclusion in a moment. And then there are other risk factors. You know, there's there's things like, um, you know, dogs flying in the cargo uh, of, a, of a plane being transported across the country or across the world um, that can lead up to some separation anxiety. Um, not all guaranteed, but possible. Oh, and, and one thing I do like to highlight with people is that it's very, very unlikely that your client is the reason why the dog has separation anxiety. Um, so I really try to make sure they know that because uh, my clients, almost all of them, when I say that to them, they like instantly, <laughs> you know, the, their shoulders relax, like, okay, cool. Awesome. I didn't cause this to happen. Um, and, and so I think they, they do feel a lot of pressure and a lot of guilt um, unless the dog came to them with separation anxiety. Um, but I think it is really important that if, you're, if your client's coming to you and they're concerned about this, that we do take a little bit of an empathetic approach and, and we let them know it's very unlikely that you caused this. And if you did have an impact, you're probably not the sole reason why your dog is experiencing this. Okay, so what can we do if, um, or, or what can your clients do if, if they think their dog might be suffering from separation anxiety? There are some things that they can do right away, and this is kind of just my top five. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, a, a science-based approach. It's not anything that anyone has influenced in me. It's just kind of what I've come up with. So I'll give that disclaimer there. But these are kind of my top five things that a client might do to really get a head start or even identify if their dog does have separation anxiety to be able to resolve it. The first thing is to ditch the crate. I am pro crate. I use a crate with my puppy. I think all dogs should be crate trained um, because there's probably gonna be a time in their life where that's gonna be beneficial for them, whether it's car rides, um, you know, sport, um, you know, if they've gotta be crated in between trials of a sport, uh, if they are hospitalized, there, there's a lot of reasons why a crate can be really beneficial. Um, but I think when it comes to dogs who are experiencing separation anxiety, um, the, the, the confinement element on top of being alone is a really, really, really extra scary thing. Um, so imagine if you were scared of something and you were trapped in a small space with that thing that you're afraid of and you had no ability to get out. Um, it's gonna make that fear much, much more um, severe than if you were you know, in, in a very big, large area with the ability to escape. So when we've taken that um, ability for a dog to get to safety and get you know, out of harm's way, um, that can be, um, that can that can make things worse that can exacerbate things so i always tell clients let's work without the crate if you have a goal to use the crate in the long run we can add that back in but i don't think it's necessary for for somebody to use a crate even in the young dogs um, you can use larger confinement areas if you're if you're concerned about your dog um, or, or if your client is concerned about their dog getting into things or you know making sure that rooms are blocked off um, really puppy proofing, but I think it's, it's really important to give more of a sense of freedom um, so that they're able to, um, I guess, uh, the anxiety is able to be lowered and they're not so, so, so panicked because not only are they alone, but they're trapped in a small space. I saw some chat stuff and I don't know how, to, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, like Lindsay, I have ADHD and I actually forgot to take my pill today. So this is going to be fun. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Oh my gosh, funny Anne. Okay, great. I'm gonna leave that. I'll check that again at the end because otherwise I'm gonna get off track. So um, next thing we can do, which I don't think is necessarily in, these aren't in any specific order. Um, they're just kind of thrown together because I think they're all kind of important, but get a recording of an absence. 
So actually videotape the dog when they're alone, because we've all seen those videos of dogs who, um, you know, they shred the pillow. And then my favorite is a, I think it's a Boston Terrier or Frenchie um, who shreds the pillow and then there's feathers everywhere. And then it starts zooming around the whole room and is having a blast. Um, well, how do I know that separation anxiety versus a dog having a really fun time? My, my previous dog, Augie, loved garbage parties. If he was alone in a room with a garbage bag, he would tear that thing apart. Um, he did not have separation anxiety. He just really liked garbages. And so I think it's important that we're getting our eyes on our dogs and, and really identifying the body language that we see. We're, we're paying attention to what's happening when they're alone rather than, you know, getting the reports from the neighbors that the dog is barking because they could be barking at something unrelated to being alone, right? Um, or, you know, the dog was destructive. Well, were they destructive because they were bored? I had a consult the other day with somebody whose dog started eating the house plants and she was convinced he had separation anxiety. And I was like, I don't think he actually does because when I assessed him, he didn't have any signs of stress excuse me, and uh, he, the, the plants, she showed me the plants, there are plants that had like, you know, sticks. <laughs> like, I think your dog just likes to chew sticks. And so um, it, that was like my best assessment or my favorite assessment because I got to say your dog's just bored. Um, so increase the enrichment. But anyway, record an absence because it's really crucial to understanding if your dog is panicking or if they're bored. Um, and on top of that too, if you're a skilled professional and you work with these types of cases or any kind of anxiety, you're probably able to have a good enough conversation without having to videotape the dog. Um, there are many times where it's very clear to me based on history that I don't need to put the dog through an assessment, um, an actual video assessment because of the history. Um, or they've already had a video um, recording that they can send to me. Um, but there are there are times where you know they've they've gotten eyes on them and they tell me what happens you know based on their verbal camera that kind of stuff. But anyway, recording an absence is really um, helpful. All right, suspending absences. Now this is probably the hardest part for clients. Um, you know, not having the dog be alone until they're ready, and it's possible. It really is possible. Um, not for everybody. Not everybody has the resources. And that's something that we have to figure out. Um, but most people do have some sort of ability, especially now during a pandemic, um, you know, where we, we can suspend absences, meaning the dog is not left alone until they're ready. They can be with somebody. It's not that the person has to stay home with their dog, um, but they just can't be left alone till they're, till they're ready. And I like to relate it to things like, um, you know, stranger danger. You know, we're gonna we're gonna restrict our dog's access to strangers and we're gonna prevent them from experiencing any interaction with a stranger until they're ready to do so. Um, same thing with a dog who's experiencing distress when they are alone. So we wanna do our best to make sure that absences are being suspended regardless of if they've started training because if we can take out that anxiety and we can get them feeling better, we can get their cortisol level back to normal. Um, we, we can often have a lot more success moving forward with training. And so, yeah, there's, there's many ways you, that clients can accomplish this, you know, daycare, if it's appropriate for the dog, or there's a good daycare around, um, trade services, you know, we could trade our dog training services for somebody to watch our dog for an hour or two, um, whatever it is, reach out to neighbors. I had a client who was a, a foster in a rescue, and she had a team of people um, with that, that would take the dog when foster family had to work or go to events because they wanted to still have a life, of course. And one person, um, because the dog was a lovely, lovely senior dog who was very, very mild tempered and sweet, um, they would bring her to work with, with this volunteer brought her to work at a nursing home. And so it's really nice because then the nursing home residents got to interact with this wonderful dog and the dog didn't have to be alone. Um, there are creative ways to do this that don't cost money and, and that are not as stressful as somebody might think. And then there's veterinary intervention. Um, I'm a big supporter of bridging that gap between behavior and medical um, well-being because I think that they're so connected. And so I think veterinary intervention not only helps with the dog um, having that consultation and being able to talk to the vet about medication early instead of waiting until it's needed, right? Um, because we all know that medication can be such a big help 
in dogs who have any kind of fear or anxiety. Um, I'm not a vet, so I, I don't count. Um, I don't counsel my clients on what to do with medication. I send them to a veterinarian, um, but I do support medication and the use of training, especially in separation anxiety. Um, and using a veterinarian that is comfortable uh, with that conversation. So there are vets that don't have an interest in behavior and that's totally fine. They don't have to. Um, so if, if that's the case, there are other options. You know, in Minnesota, we have the vet behaviorists. There's also vet behaviorists that will consult directly with veterinarians. Um, I recently had my vet consult with Dr. Radasta out of um, Florida. And that was a really, really lovely experience. Um, and so there are options for that. Um, but getting a consultation on board with the vet to see if there's something that can help in the meantime. Um, and then also ruling out underlying medical conditions um, so that we, we know like are, are, the, are the dogs experiencing something medical that if we resolve that, maybe the separation anxiety will either lessen substantially um, or they just feel better and they no longer are panicking when they're alone. And then of course, seek help. Um, early is best because the more that a dog experiences alone time, um, the more that the client has this overwhelming experience trying to manage and trying to figure out how to do it and reading all this information online that could be helpful but could also be harmful, um, the more that the dog is just gonna suffer. Um, you know, potentially a, a, a dog owner will have really great success. I've had clients who said, you know, I, I resolved this on my own a couple of years ago and it's back now because of whatever um, that happened. Um, I just moved to a new house and now my dog has anxiety again. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that they're, they're seeking help um, as, as soon as they can because it's not an easy thing. Um, and not every dog trainer wants to work with separation anxiety. I, I bet you, if I asked all of you guys, I bet you not 100% of you would say, I, I like separation anxiety, give me cases. In fact, a lot of people won't even touch it. They'll, they'll see anything related to separation anxiety and they're like, nope, not mine. Um, and that's totally fine. But I think it's also important to know who, who they're hiring. So are they hiring somebody that is going to refer out if it's not their case type? Are they hiring somebody that has a support group um, where, where they can um, reach out for help? You know, I've got colleagues and, and friends who are um, CSATs as well, um, certified separation anxiety trainer. And I frequently will, um, there's a couple of them that I will consult with and, and they ask me questions about their cases and I'll ask questions about mine if we get stuck. So do they have that network where, you you know, they, they have the ability to call on other people to get some fresh eyes on the case. Um, and then, of course, a qualified dog trainer who's not going to harm the dog as well. Um, you know, we're not going to use shot collars for barking. We're not going to, you know, harm the dog for, for the behaviors that they're doing. We're going to change how they feel about being alone. Um, I really, really love this quote from Milena, uh, Milena Demartini Price's newest book, which just came out recently. Um, a behavioral emergency or behavioral crisis occurs when the sufferer of a condition experiences episodes of fear and anxiety. This emergency can overwhelm them and result in further detriment emotionally or physically. Um, and so I think that's where, you know, it's really important for our clients to know this isn't just something that is kind of, you know, I'll get to it when I get to it. When it's separation, anxiety, in my opinion, it truly is a behavioral emergency. Um, we have to be able to leave our dogs. Very few of us are going to stay home trapped with our dogs forever. Um, so this is something that's really, really important that dogs can um, overcome. And the earlier, the better, of course. Um, there are some resources, of course, I'm very biased. So these are all related to Melina Martini, and she has no idea I put them on there, but she would probably be okay with it. Um, if you're interested in, in learning how to do work with separation anxiety, she has a certification program that's usually um, full for about six months out. So um, reach out early. If clients don't have the financial resources to work with a trainer, she does have a self-paced online course on her website called Mission Possible. Um, it's really, really fabulous. And it's um, currently got over a thousand students in the, in the course. It's very um, popular right now. Um, but it's a really wonderful course for people who are more DIY types. Um, and then she's got a great blog um, section on her website where she's got some of her own staff that um, yeah, contribute pieces as well. I put the question slide, but I talked too much, so we're not doing that. Um, but if you have questions, you can email me. Uh, I also can be found on, on my website if you don't remember this email, and that's totally fine. Um, let me look, though. I think there is chat stuff, and I don't know how to get to it. There it is. 
Da -da -da. Double my dose with, oh, okay, yeah. I definitely didn't double my dose with my ADHD meds. I should have. Um, yeah, and Katie, I agree. Pandemic is a great time for clients to address separation anxiety because they're already home. They, they don't have to worry so much about absences. Um, cool, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I know a lot of you guys do send me cases and I do just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you very much because um, without referrals, you know, a lot of people just wouldn't know where to go. So it's, I think it's really lovely that we can all refer to each other and, and help out. Um, but let's see, I'm going to stop my share because that's everything. And do I have to give post back to somebody? Probably back to Anne. I don't think you actually have to unless you want to because um, we're uh, I don't think anyone else is going to be sharing their screen um, or joining at this point but um, I just wanted to tell everyone thank you thank you thank you so much I'm so excited I was jotting notes all the time about all the stuff I'm going to do different in classes now and all of the different things so this was super inspiring um, and, you know, Allison touched on it too, but we need community. We need to be able to bounce things around and learn from each other. So um, by being here, it's not only a great service to each other, but to all of the dogs in our community and all the people we can help. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. And thank you for hosting this and putting it together. Oh, it was easy. Everyone else did all the work, but thank you so much. <laughs> Minnesota Dog Trainers Rule and, and North Dakota. And Fargo. <laughs> Fargo. <laughs>